Hallo, CityLab. Welkom in Amsterdam. Amsterdam has always been a place to be inspired and to develop individuality. And innovation is at the core of what makes our city run. Every city uses data uh, to know what's going on uh, in your city. We don't want to collect all the information, so we only collect data when we really need to. What the city of Amsterdam does is they actually provide information on events about privacy and citizens are actively asked, is that the city you want? The model that we're working with uh, in the city is donut economics and the outer ring are the ecological limits of the planet. And then you have the inner circle, which is the social foundation. It's about living within planetary boundaries, but it's also about having a healthy life within this planetary boundary. In order to create a livable planet, you need vegetation. We should use nature as a coat covering the city on as much places as possible. The city of Amsterdam is absolutely at the forefront of creating a resilient city and a livable city for its inhabitants. Amsterdam wants to become this little place in the world that starts to heal the planet as a whole. So hopefully whatever we're doing has a rippling effect with other parts of the world. This is how a city should function, right? You really can speak up and you really can be part of the change. We are so proud to be hosting CityLab this year. And I can't wait to learn from one another globally. Please welcome to the stage the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, Dan Porterfield. I like that walk up song. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two. Uh, it's so our honor, the Aspen Institute, to be a part of this remarkable proceeding. As you just saw, the city of Amsterdam is a place of innovation and individuality and community. It's inspiring to see how Mayor Halsema and her team are protecting digital privacy, are promoting what they call donut economics, and are investing in nature-based solutions to the dangers of climate change. Please join me in thanking this great city for its hospitality and its canals and its example. Let us also take a moment now to thank all of those who prepared our meals and drove our shuttles and housed us in comfort and designed this stage. Thank you to all. And let us thank the dedicated team of Bloomberg Aspen colleagues who brought this ninth annual summit into being, especially Oh, <laughs> especially Courtney Greenwald, Noel Thorne-Renner, Caitlin McGee, Kitty Boone, Elliot Gerson, Ava Hartman, Natalie Schultz, Patty Harris, Jim Anderson, and of course, Mayor Mike Bloomberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amsterdam is a city of rich diversity and culture with brick pathways that wind and turn and bridge and lead us into epiphanies we could only find here. The same can be said of this year's City Lab. Where else could we have encountered that tender giant of a puppet named Amal, whose gift is to awaken empathy? Where else could we have met two of our planet's first seven chief heat officers, all women, leading the way, and learn about life-saving new concepts like shade equity and cool route mapping systems. And where else could we have met that TikTok marvel, Dilla Thomas, who brings stories of his great city right to the palm of your hand? For me, the spirit running through this convening is one of civic imagination. Each of us comes here 
with a vision of something that is needed, something better, something shared. We imagine the futures we want for our beloved communities and then build them here at City Lab, along with the will and the skill and the know-how to bring those dreams to life. Today, City Lab continues our invitation to civic imagination. We will think together about the urban metaverse and the possibilities around crypto and the roles of storytellers in our cities. We will learn from two Ukrainian mayors what it means to lead and serve and sacrifice in a time of terrorism, trauma, and war. And in the breaks between our panel discussions and the breakouts, we'll share hopes and contacts and lessons learned, resources for change making that we'll bring back to wherever it is from which we came. About one mile from here, and almost eight decades ago, Anne Frank wrote from her family's perilous hiding place, quote, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before trying to improve the world. City Lab reminds us that across our oceans and our cultures and our different lives and cities, we all believe in that vision. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our first panel discussion, Facing History to Forge a Brighter Future. Some places have chosen to lean in to the most difficult chapters of their past, finding innovative ways to unearth, examine, and memorialize even the most difficult and inhumane, if not wicked, chapters of their history. How should cities grapple with these painful moments and histories that live on in different ways in the present? Joining us to reflect on this question are three eminent thinkers and leaders. London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco, Piotr Sawinski, director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Historic Museum, and Nancy Yahweh, a cultural historian and author who has examined the history and legacy of slavery in this country and in Europe and beyond. I'd now like to welcome our panelists to the stage. Thank you. So we start today with an extraordinarily difficult topic, and one in which each of you in your different ways has been a remarkable leader for, uh, the, for the people of the past, the present, and the future. And let me start by going around to each one of you with a general question, and that is, what is the value for individuals and for society of our making the effort to understand the history and human reality of terrible hardship, of atrocity, um, of genocide, of slavery, of oppression. Why is it that we should do this? And perhaps I could start with Dr. Swinsky. Thank you. Uh, I think the value are different in the different steps after some uh, trauma, like in an individual life, let's say. If you are under a traumatic experience, first you, you are under the shock, after you follow, uh, you, you, you f yes, it's, it's, it's a time of silence, let's say, after you try to understand, you try to speak, and you maybe uh, arrive to a moment when you, when you, uh, when you arrive to, to, to a perception of the future, how to, how to get out of this trauma. And uh, now when the, when the last survivors are, are passing out, I think we are, we are in this last period, we understand better than it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago that the remembrance is a key to understand the, the present time and certainly a key to, 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 to create a, a better future. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, how about you? You have excavated untold histories and systems that allowed uh, for slavery. What is the value of reaching back to pull those stories and those um, experiences into the present? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a um, pleasure to be here. 
Um, I th I'm thinking of a couple of things. Um, fighting ignorance uh, is a big thing, because in the Netherlands up to the 2000s, we were taught that slavery was an American history, not Dutch history, let alone you know the history of this city or any other city. Um, I think it's also recognizing um, you know p histories of families, individuals that have been silenced, but also collectively taking accountability. I think yeah. um, is really really important, and it um, shows us the way to the future. Because if you don't know you know the, our past then um, you're not going to enter the future wholly as a, as a, you know, yeah. as a community, yeah. I would say. Um, let me follow up for a second. So, uh, and uh, any of you could address this, but how do you deal with the line of thinking that goes, oh my goodness, why do we have to bring up these past horrors? It's just going to create dissension. It's, you know, we got to move on. we got to turn the page. H how do you deal with that? Well, um, keeping the conversation going, yeah. uh, keeping it on the table. The thing is, people become uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, but in the 60s in the Netherlands, um, people weren't talking about the, the Jewish um, population. Uh, every other Dutch person was part of the resistance, for instance. So people had to mm -hmm. learn to become, you know, sensitive to the Jewish community. The same should go for the history of slavery. We should, you know, we should keep talking about it. Um, peop yeah, and, and so um, go beyond that uncomfortability. And, and also, you know, on the way, develop an idiom uh, that uh, acknowledges that past, but also makes a connection to things like race, yeah. for instance. Because again, in the Netherlands, we don't have a shared, well-developed idiom on race. Yeah. And we're always pointing to the US like, oh, you know, we don't want to um, introduce your discourse here. But it was Europe and it was the Netherlands to, who exported race to the Americas, not the other way around. Yeah. It's interesting, this, this notion of an idiom. We in the United States are constantly struggling over language right now. Who used what word to describe what circumstance? Who has the authority or legitimacy to speak on which topic. Um, you're a mayor, you have some degree of authority. We know that mayors <laughs> have maybe more persuasive power than power to just will what you want into being. But how do you deal with this question in San Francisco of the various pasts of your city and the various communities that look back to a time when wrong was done to them? Well, it's interesting because being here, I really reflected on this when I visited the Anne Frank Museum. And what was interesting about that experience is I saw a family there with kids who were probably like five or six. And you had parents explaining to their children how this kid was basically not able to play with other kids not able to see the light, not able to do the things that these children are fortunate enough to take for granted. Um, you have these kinds of situations, but you also sadly have parents who are raising kids quite differently. Yeah. The importance of really making sure um, that these stories are told is to make sure that people understand and know history, but also they understand what needs to be done to not repeat it and, and also make the investments around po uh, financial, uh, financial investments, policy changes, and other things that are going to help to get us to a better place. As elected leaders, we have to be prepared to make bold action, and sometimes it's not always popular. I remember when, you know, because our trans community in San Francisco is highly discriminated against, and when you look at the data, people talk about the data all the time, you know, disproportionately yeah. who's impacted by the data. We know what the problems are, but the question is, are we prepared for the solutions? So I introduced universal income for our trans community, uh, uh, Trans Home SF, and a number of initiatives that help to target the disparities. And what was interesting was really a lot of the negative, you know, comments that came as a result of that. But I know oftentimes people in elected capacity, they want to be popular, they want people to love and praise what they do. But I think we're at a different point in history where we need to really focus on the right thing and moving things forward uh, to really correct some of the injustices of the past. Now, San Francisco is the home of...
San Francisco is the home of Angel Island, which was the location where many uh, Chinese would-be immigrants came and waited and waited and waited, only to be sent back to China um, and to die on that passage to or from. Uh, today, the Asian American community in San Francisco and around America has experienced a real spike in discriminatory action, hate crimes. Um, this isn't a San Francisco problem, this is an American problem, but how are you thinking about that problem in particular? It's been so complicated in San Francisco and you know, we have a over 30% Asian population in particular, and many of our Asian seniors have been targeted. Um, of course, part of it is accountability and consequences for those behaviors that cross the line. But the other thing is bridge building, yeah. learning about one another's culture, bringing people together. I was so proud of people in the black community um, who basically stood up and said, we're going to go and patrol and keep people in Chinatown safe as a result yeah. of all the things that were happening. Having those discussions, learning about one another, continuing to come together because, you know, that's going to be an important part of how we move forward. And, you know, what you find out is there's so much more that we have in common um, than we do uh, in terms of our differences. And, and we got to keep these conversations going. We got to keep providing opportunities for people to come together um, because that's really what's going to help us get there. But we also, again, as I said, need to be prepared to take bold action when necessary. Um, the mayor, we, well, we met chief heat officers yesterday. Maybe the mayor is the chief hope officer, the chief mm -hmm. community officer, bringing the community together. Uh, to reweave the bonds of community uh, in times of trial. So I want to go back now to ask you a little bit about the role of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. And I've, I've been there. Uh, extraordinary, never sort of forgettable experience. We are all told, never forget, never forget. Um, and yet, you look around the world, and again and again, people are forgetting and whether it's anti-Semitism or genocide in different places in the world or the unwillingness to acknowledge what has happened in the past, forgetting seems to be as much a part of people's sensibility as remembering. Uh, I hope that's not true, but how do you think about the role of Auschwitz-Birkenau given the realities of the world we live in today? Uh, I think we are living in a world in uh, some very, very quick changes, and, and those changes are more and more aggressive and quick. So we need terrifically some very strong referring point in our common experience. And Auschwitz is a symbol of a very heavy and difficult, but referring point, let's say, uh, in, in our history. That's why uh, before the pandemic, there were 2.3 millions of visitors per year. Uh, especially young people, and I hope that it will help them, it, it can help them certainly, to judge, to understand and to judge the present time, to find their own answer in their own society, uh, to find their own, let's say, responsibility uh, to, 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 to create something new, something better, something more human, let's say. Uh, this is, I, I think, the main goal uh, and the main hope that I have. If not, all these remembrance do not serve to anything. Yeah. Um, I had the experience after visiting Auschwitz of starting to read the memoirs of people who had survived. Um, and there were many, Jean Amory, mm. uh, Primo Levi, uh, Elie Wiesel, um, Victor Frankl. Mm. Uh, if all these individuals came out of that inferno mm. with the need to tell their story, but the stories were different even as they were also the same. How do you think about the, the voices of those who have survived? They are extremely important, uh, but very difficult to be heard because they are speaking in our language about a reality that is coming from a completely different world. Uh, we do not have an Auschwitz language to explain Auschwitz. We are speaking in our language. And, and this, is, this is the biggest problem. They are trying to translate their experience into the language of people who didn't experience that. Yeah. That is exactly what Jean Amory said, and he found the effort meaningless because he couldn't actually convey 
what it was that... And that's why know. many of them didn't tell the story at all. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, Nancy, mm -hmm. in your work, um, how much of what you are doing allows you to bring back into public life the voices of those or the experience of those who were silenced? Or does your work focus more on the systems in Amsterdam and other places that, uh, that allowed others to be dehumanized? I think, yeah, a couple of things. W w uh, we're actually, you know, if you go into the city, and uh, I'm going to give a tour at 11.15, uh, where we're going to do a boat tour through uh, the city. If you look at the city, you can read it as an archive. Uh, there's so many material remnants uh, in the buildings, and, um, you know, it's just about, you know, changing your lens and starting to look differently at the city that you walk through, like I do, and others um, on a, you know, daily basis. But those uh, material remnants are connected to people's stories. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, uh, what we're trying to do uh, when we you know, do these tours or theater makers imagine what the voices of you know, black women who are brought here as servants, um, yeah. uh, you know, what they would be yeah. thinking or talking about. Um, you know, on Dutch soil proper, slavery was forbidden since the Middle Ages. So what was the um, you know, legal position yeah. of people, enslaved people, who were brought in from Indonesia, South Africa, Burbis, um, New York, um, the Caribbean, to the metropole, to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam? Um, we don't know. Yeah. Um, so these are the stories, I think. Mm. So tell us something that we'll see, one thing we'll see on today's tour to whet our appetite. Well, we're gonna actually pass the mayor's house uh, you know, the mayor herself, and that house used to be owned by a slave uh, owner, uh, very simply. So, and if you just look at, you know, the 100 meters in that street, every, literally every um, house has a story. So I hope, you know, some filmmaker one day will make a series out of that, just, you know, those 100 meters. Th there's tons of stories. And we're talking about a history that is global. Because from, you know, from the U.S., we're basically... Uh, taught that it's about the transatlantic slavery. Uh, but in the case of the Netherlands and Europe, I would say it's also about Indian Ocean slavery. Um, so we're talking about, um, you know, a global history if we talk about the Netherlands. Well, thank you. We're excited to see it today. Um, so let me ask you a, a, a question about the role of being the chief spokesperson for community, for justice, for humanity, for breaking down the barriers between us. It's a tough role. Mm -hmm. And um, what was it that made you want to take this role? Well, I think it had a lot to do with um, my experience of growing up in San Francisco in poverty and being frustrated. Like, I have this story that people are always amazed that, you know, I lived in poverty, raised by my grandmother, never knew my biological father, brothers in jail, sister died from a drug overdose. Like, it's like, oh my goodness, right? But that was almost everybody around me with something very similar. And I was angry that we felt isolated, that we felt like there were no opportunities. And I was just very blessed um, to have people who really helped to support me, to get me into college, to help me with scholarships and get through that. So now being mayor, because again, a lot of times people are, you know, you want to do the things you need to do to be elected, but I'm not afraid to lose my job. I think that it's important that when we do these jobs, we can't do them based on whether or not we're trying to get elected. We have to do them based on what we need to do to support the cities that we represent. And in fact, during the whole Black Lives Matter movement, you had so many people making commitments to the black community. We're gonna support the black community. All of this money was supposedly coming out of the sky and I'm still trying to understand, well, where is it? And in San Francisco, and, in, and I'll tell you, in San Francisco, we said we're gonna give $60 million and annualize it specifically, even though we have a less than 5% black population in San Francisco, it's like almost 40% of the homelessness, yep. disproportionately in the terms of the overdose deaths, all of the, a lot of the disparities in our criminal justice system, 
we are going to commit to this every year, which includes economic opportunity, home ownership opportunity. We have a number of people who have already uh, closed on their fo first home, African Americans who grew up in San Francisco. So it's like, again, it, it can't just be the conversation or, or, or the theme of today or what's popular. It's how do you, after all of the lights and cameras go away, how do you still make it happen despite you know, all of that. And, and that's really what we need to start doing, not just elected officials, but like companies and, 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 and how we um, start to make those kinds of investments and step outside of just what we're trying to do for yeah. ourselves. How are we making society a better place by our time commitments, by our policy changes, by our financial investments? What are we doing to make things better? And that really can change the world. You, rem you remind me of that uh, great American philosopher, Mother Jones, mm -hmm. who said, we honor the dead by fighting like hell for the living. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for being here. We wish we had more time. Thank what you. a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to take a second to acknowledge that is a difficult panel to follow. There was a lot of very heavy, very important stuff. And we're going to talk about something that is grounded much less in history and much more in the now and potentially the future. We'll see what we, what we think about that. So y some of you, hopefully all of you, would have gotten a, a pair of polls this morning, one of which asked the question, do you know what a digital twin is? And the other asked the question, how many of you are considering or have been considering something to do with blockchain and blockchain policy? And I want to share those results because I feel like they're very relevant to what we're going to talk about today, which is that for the blockchain question, only around 15 or so percent of you, or less than 15 percent of you, said you were considering using blockchain. And then a 40 percent of you were like shruggy emoji, like not super sure exactly what that might mean. So we're going to spend just a couple of minutes at the top like talking a little bit about the implications of crypto and cities. So I'm joined by Mark and Tonatzin, who have, shall I say, very different perspectives on how we think about crypto. So just to start, in the context of policy, in the context of cities, Tonatzin, you wrote a, a piece for Brookings, where you're a fellow, that essentially argued that mayors need to be a little bit cautious mm -hmm. as it relates to betting the farm, the virtual farm, on things to do with crypto and blockchain. Can you share just a little bit about what you meant by that and what some of those bets have looked like to date? Uh, the, sorry, the second part? What, what some of the bets are that mayors have been oh, placing on crypto? Sure. So I actually got into this space um, because I noticed this trend of elected officials, mayors, uh, really touting this technology, embracing the technology, crypto specifically, and uh, romanticizing it. And so I actually wanted to understand how. How do we get from crypto to all of these promises that they were kind of embracing or touting, and, and from those promises, a whole host of solutions that were somehow supposed to solve everything, it seemed. And um, in doing my research, I found that actually there are a host of risks and drawbacks related to the technology um, itself. Uh, but then not only the technology, there's policy limitations that create their own drawbacks, and there were also things like negative externalities. And so with the technology itself, we saw things that um, essentially leave it open to bugs and hacks. There were also a lot of reporting on scams and fraud. And right now, at least in the United States, there are not a ton of consumer protections of any. And so in terms of safety, it actually wasn't something that you could safely uh, promote, I think, or, or promote for its safety features. And so um, I, I think that's kind of what started to ring my alarm bells. And, then I also noted that there were other factors such as negative externalities like pertaining to the environment specifically and very, very localized externalities. And so 
I won't get into the specifics of crypto mining, um, but there are some cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, for example, so it's not all of them, that use a verification process that requires computers to verify transactions, to uh, mine new Bitcoin, and these processes require these high-powered computers to operate constantly. And so what you end up seeing is obviously like a, a significant energy consumption. Um, and with that comes, you know, our, our issues with our, car our carbon output. And then you also have um, p noise pollution, water pollution. And one thing that I found interesting was that for localities that were really embracing or trying to attract Bitcoin mining facilities to their jurisdictions, some uh, residents even found the high cost of their energy bills, um, whether they were using crypto or not. And so all of these things um, were taking place in terms of the risks themselves. And then I wrote a little bit about the various use cases that were um, being touted. One example was like financial inclusion, for example. And so folks are saying that, oh, it's going to create more avenues for building wealth or it's going to allow for transactions um, for the unbanked, for making financial transactions for the unbanked or underbanked. And thus far, the evidence just isn't there. And so I think one thing that I would just highlight for this group to really think about when you're talking about crypto or just technology and emerging technologies more broadly is that it's really important to distinguish between the present capabilities of a technology versus the potential. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about the potential, yes, it is incredibly seductive to think about the upsides, but it's also really important to think about the risks and the drawbacks, particularly if it might impact people. Before we go too much into some of what those you know, pres other present considerations are, I want to emphasize something that you said. You, know, you use the word technology a lot. And there's a joke for those of you who might be in and around crypto that eventually, if you talk about it enough, someone will say the phrase underlying technology. So I'm just going to get that out of the way very early. <laughs> um, when, when we're talking about crypto, when we're talking about blo blockchain, what we're essentially discussing is a couple of different things that all get smushed together. So you know, you will hear, if any of you are texting with um, Mayor Suarez in Miami, he has probably pitched you on kind of like the financial elements of crypto, the idea that you can use certain types of tokens that have currency-like features and do things like receive taxes in them or, or pay salaries in them. If you are speaking to other folks, they may talk about the potential for the database element of crypto, which is like that blockchain piece, which is really just a way of storing and retrieving information. Um, they will say, you know, hey, you could have records and archives on this thing in a way that is much less vulnerable to the potential for hacks or it's, you know, it's designed to be very resilient. But it's all software, right? And so at a fundamental level, the considerations that you have right now around like vendors and procurement is kind of a very similar mindset that you should take when somebody comes pitching a crypto thing or a blockchain thing. You know, the, the very same questions that you've identified. But Mark, in your ex significant experience, both in the private sector and in the public sector, particularly with a focus on the EU, there's an element of crypto and blockchain that is a little bit specific and it's around regulation. And the fact that, as Tunatsin mentioned, these are technologies that can have pretty significant environmental externalities that could have effects on consumer protection. What are some of the regulatory considerations that folks need to be aware of broadly? Yeah, thank you. I, th I think that's right. There's, um, there's more and more need to have a kind of collaboration between the public sector and private sector. Um, over here in Europe, there's been legislation, because often in Europe we legislate before we uh, kind of let things develop. So a lot of the work in terms of the conversation between industry and uh, the legislators has been around trying to understand some definitions. So what are we actually talking about here? What is the technology that underpins this? Mm -hmm. What are the different use cases? What are the functionality? Um, and how, I think, going forward, can we have a situation whereby, um, you know, we have a public and private collaboration where you potentially have stable coins that are kind of working on the same ecosystem uh, and things like that. A lot of the, um, from a European perspective, we're looking at this idea of a central bank digital currency. So again, Which a public be sector. Like a digital dollar or a digital euro. Yeah, exactly. Other, other jurisdictions are looking into it as well. And, uh, but again, it's, it, it's really about, and this is coming back to the mayors and the kind of public sector, what do you want to use that technology for? Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, a, a large part of industry, at least 
people that I'm working with are very keen to have the legal certainty that a legislative regime can bring, because that enables to drive uh, not only innovation, but also investment into, th into the right areas to be able to uh, create the products and services that, p that people want. Um, but again, you have to kind of avoid a kind of cannibalization, perhaps, of the two things, because obviously private sector and public sector will have different interests. And at the moment, we're still kind of in Europe getting through exactly defining what is what these different aspects are, how they can work together, uh, and then how, how we can have a, a legislative regime which ensures that uh, you know there are safeguards there around uh, consumer protection, investor protection, but also authorization and registra registration. So the supervisory elements to that as well. And they're just finishing that really in Europe now, um, but obviously it's gonna be a, a long story with other elements going down, uh, down the track on Web3, on uh, NFTs, on, on DeFi. That's a lot of things you're going to make me define now, aren't you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> fun times. Um, so, and just for context, the U.S. Is, is sort of very similar. A little bit less, I wouldn't say that the U.S. has taken a regulatory forward approach. I would say that there are a lot of different kinds of considerations around should the people who want to issue crypto tokens, Mark mentioned stable coins, which are, the hint is in the name, they're supposed to be less volatile than Bitcoin and not go up or down 20% by the time this panel is over. Um, and the idea there is because they have much more currency-like features in terms of that stability, that perhaps they should only be issued by entities like banks, which of course banks are like very keen on because then they can sweep up all the money associated with those things and various crypto companies are like, that's unfair. Wall Street has better lobbyists than we do. When you talk about things though, like NFTs, um, you're gonna hear from another person today who's gonna talk about non-fungible tokens in the context of public art. For the past 12 or so months, if you had been following the conversation about NFTs, it, you might associate like Tom Brady in a Super Bowl ad or Kim Kardashian pitching a kind of a token. But these, these things have a, like a public facing perspective, which is here's a very expensive picture of a monkey, and, which is true. And then they have this underlying technology idea, which they're designed to be enabling mechanisms for lots of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. In a city context, or the only place that I would say that has done a sort of a large scale experiment as it relates to anything to do with crypto is actually in El Salvador, which uh, about a year ago became the first country in the world to accept Bitcoin as legal tender alongside the US dollar, which is its other currency. And you know, so policy people around the world who love writing case studies are like, ooh, this is fun, let's see what's happening. And a couple of things came to light immediately. The first is any large-scale technology rollouts is very hard. <laughs> and so the first thing that El Salvador encountered were kind of, you have to get people to download software, right? Like for somebody to interact with blockchain, they have to have some sort of internet-enabled smartphone device. You have to get people to then understand the software that they've just downloaded. I mean, me this morning trying to figure out which part of the City Lab app I should be looking at. It's like I'm a fairly tech savvy person, and yet, uh, you know, these this is a this is a hard user journey. And then there are policy considerations around. Okay, how do you, for instance, tax, you know, capital gains or VAT in a in a Bitcoin context? How do you think about if somebody has a customer service problem? If an ATM eats your bank card, you can call a bank. If a crypto app eats your Bitcoin, the, the whole idea is there isn't necessarily a central authority for you to appeal to. And so, you know, Tanatin, just to kind of go back to that point, in, in the context of folks who are thinking about this at this municipal level, this policy level, this like sub-federal level, what are some of the other kinds of considerations that you've encountered in your work on those issues? Is if you had another, if somebody were to come to you and say, you know, in should my neighborhood or should, should my city, should my town accept Bitcoin, yes or no? Is that a yes or no answer? Should my, ooh, that's a, that's, I don't wanna give a yes or no. Well, I, cause I'm, I'm more in the like skeptical lane, but I think because I, I really believe that we're not quite there yet. The technology at its present state, the consumer protections at their present state are not quite there yet that, I, that you're kind of safe to say yes, pursue this. There's obviously a conversation about potential. Um, but I think more broadly, one of the things that I think a lot about in this space, and, and I keep referring to technology and innovation because I think this, crypto has taught us, I think, a lot more um, about thinking from more like a principles, like criteria standpoint um, that go beyond crypto. And I, I, re I recognize that 
local leaders are under constant pressure to adopt new technologies, to adapt, to innovate, to improve the lives of residents and businesses. Mm -hmm. But if we're starting with the tech first or the like crypto first, the solution first, we miss out on a whole lot by not actually trying to start with the problem first, by identifying what exactly are we trying to do here? What are we trying to solve? What is the pain point? And once you start with that problem first, then you maybe take a human-centered approach to really clarify what exactly you're trying to do with the outcomes as your North Star. So you're not just trying to say yes or no crypto for crypto's sake, mm -hmm. you're actually being thoughtful about the outcomes that you were trying to envision or, or trying to get to for your residents and your um, communities. And so I think one thing that I would say that this group should come away with is that perhaps because it's not gonna just be crypto, it is worthwhile to develop a set of principles or criteria for uh, dealing with emerging technologies more broadly so that you can be proactive versus reactive when the next shiny object comes your way. And Mark, as a person who spends most of their day trying to help people think through problems like this, what would you add to that? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, he's got to work out what the problem is and then try and solve the problem. So it definitely shouldn't be technology first, but it definitely shouldn't be technology last either. Um, and I think, you know, uh, there are an awful lot of people in this space that are genuinely trying to provide new innovative ways of doing things than doing it in, in order to empower citizens in a lot of sense because there are you could say that a lot of the uh, new innovation has come from uh, perhaps uh, disappointments with the financial crisis and the traditional players to a certain extent. So that's not to say that everything new is going to be good. Uh, and there really is a need, as I said, for this kind of cooperation between public sector and private sector. I I've seen a lot in my work here in Europe that the, the policymakers are keen to learn and understand. They, they are putting in place legislation which then needs to be implemented mm -hmm. and complied with by business and by firms. Um, mayors and cities and public authorities don't want to create rules that then you know, aren't, aren't practic practicable in the real world. So there is this kind of uh, need to work together and a desire on both sides, I think, to do that. And as I said before, you know, uh, Europe has gone further and faster perhaps than other jurisdictions, but everybody is thinking about how we can put in place a, a legislative or regulatory framework to, to offer some certainty and some uh, reassurances to, to users and citizens to how, how this can work mm -hmm. and how then it's on the public sector to decide how they want it to work. Mm -hmm. but that's a kind of conversation that the, the industry is very keen to, 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 to move forward with with together. We're going to do just a kind of a rapid address of the other big thing that people sometimes think of with crypto, which is the metaverse. Um, you know, the, the metaverse as an idea essentially means like, what if you could do everything that you're doing right now, but on a computer? So, you know, imagine Zoom, but 3D. <laughs> that's, often, that's often what a metaverse refers to, and it comes up, you know, this, the idea of like a digital twin, which some of you answered the poll question about, is if you could take, for instance, your entire supply chain and visualize it the way that architects use something like AutoCAD, where you could kind of see every single part of that replicated digitally. But there's, a, I think, a much broader conversation. We heard yesterday from, you know, the mayor here at Amsterdam of this idea that people should have ownership over their data, that they should be able to live digital lives that are not necessarily intermediated by the biggest technology companies in the world. And that is certainly something that proponents of things like blockchain argue in favor of, right? The, that there's this notion that whether you think of the metaverse as virtual reality or you think of it as a place where it's a digital public square, there's this idea that people can kind of get back in touch with the fundamentals of civic life mm -hmm. without having to be built into a Facebook platform or a, you know, a Google. Totally. I mean, I think a lot of the attractiveness comes from the fact that it is very decentralized and the idea is that a lot of it is open source. So, you know, you and I might not be able to read the code, but, but people can. So there's a whole work stream around financial education, around, you know, making sure people understand and know how to use the technology. But at a base level, I think the idea is, is, is about empowering people and enabling like a community rather than a few centralized institutions, be it financial institutions or tech companies kind of controlling things. So it's, it's a very different philosophy. It also makes it quite difficult from a public sector perspective to understand how you kind of supervise and legislate for that, because obviously we are all part of a centralized system. So there's a natural kind of tension between Absolutely. this decentralized way of doing things. Right. And that goes back to the, you know, who is the central authority to appeal to? Because if you have a completely open source network, like who's going to troubleshoot it when a user can't remember that their login to the tax system that they need to pay the taxes on their Bitcoin? Um, just as a, as a closing thought, 
if we, if you were in five years and we were sitting on the stage talking about what the most interesting experiments in crypto in a city would be, what do you think it might be? <laughs> Delegating. <laughs> I don't want to speak too much. Well, no, I, I think what it, at least crypto is doing is pushing us to have these conversations about what we're actually trying to do or solve. Like, uh, unfortunately, it's it took crypto to maybe move forward a conversation about financial inclusion. I don't necessarily think the use case is right is there yet, either for a wealth building avenue or for making financial transactions, but I'm glad that we're having a conversation again about what people actually need. And so perhaps that's the innovation, or that's the use case, it's like bringing us back to the problems, the pain points, and then building from there. And I think it's also getting beyond financial, financial kind of uh, yeah. instruments and, and the speculation side of things. Yeah. I think there's a lot more and in the underlying technology that can have, you know, a uh, good purpose. Especially when the specu speculative asset is down 70%. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>
Now, it also happened just a few years after the Berlin Wall fell down, so it was one of the first uh, things that showed unified Germany. In uh, 2005, the gates uh, for Central Park in New York City, it's actually the longest uh, project, that the time it took the longest to make a project for Christo and Jean-Claude, it took 26 years, and it really only happened because of a very supportive mayor, Michael Bloomberg, and uh, it was, uh, it, after all these years, it, and actually also the timing, these projects find their timing kind of in their own way. It happened just a few years after 9-11, and it was actually the first time that New Yorkers looked up in joy in, in, were unified with uh, this project, which happened in February of 2005 and was visited by four million visitors and in, the, in February. And uh, it's, it's really a prime example how these projects need the uh, willing partner of the, of the local government. It's easy to say no, but it's actually, it's hard to, should be hard to say no. It's uh, something that really need to, you guys need to be more adventurous. <laughs> so the floating piers in Italy in 2016 was the project that, um, that uh, was the first project actually we did after Jean-Claude passed away. After, it was the first project we did without Jean-Claude. And the London Master by in Hyde Park was the last project we did while, while Crystal was alive. And uh, before he died, he, um, he made me promise him two things, that our team would complete two of the projects that he really wanted to happen. And one is the Arc de Triomphe Wrapped, and the other one is the Mastaba for Abu Dhabi. Now, the Arc de Triomphe Wrapped was, uh, we did it in 2021 with a very supportive President Macron, who every time I saw him, he kept saying, we need more crazy art projects. <laughs> Luckily, we had also had a very supportive mayor in An Hidalgo, and uh, we didn't have a sequel to the Pont Neuf, so it was a very, <laughs> it was, a, it was a, actually one of the easiest processes we've ever had. Uh, the project employed over 1,600 people, 1,600 people. It was um, visited by 6 million visitors in 16 days. It, uh, the, the online media presence was seen by 685 million people, which is basically 10% of the world. And it, uh, it brought a lot into the local economy, 235 million for the local economy, which is, um, by, uh, which at the time of the pandemic was really something that was uh, very important. And um, we distributed free fabric samples to everybody, as with every project. And um, we had, uh, well actually you can get some here at the Bloomberg Connects Lounge. If you haven't, don't have your piece, they look like this. I'm running out of time, but they have to wait a little bit. <laughs> they look like this. And um, we love the Bloomberg Connects app, and we do everything to, I love it actually more than our website. The webmaster should know this, but it's very easy to use on the phone. Um, so, and it also shows that anything, the arbitrary on app shows that anything is impossible because this project was done 60 years after the initial idea, and both the artists were gone. Christo and Jean-Claude were no longer with us when we completed that project. So it's like really everything is possible. Um, now, it's like the, the projects brought such big exposure to the cities and places where they were done and um, a lot of uh, hundreds of millions in economic revenue and the actual the brand value for the cities is estimated in the billions. And Christo loved the above the fold cover of the New York Times which was something that was like the most special thing. Even, even the Mona Lisa rarely gets it, and it's usually when it's attacked, you know? It's not something that, that is, it was very special. But unfortunately, times have changed, or fortunately, and now what we value the most is a post by Cardi B. It's, uh, it's <laughs> everybody seems to be going for that, so. <laughs> and um, in these fast-changing times, we really try to use all the available tools to us for promotion and awareness of the project and financing of the project. So we've done LiDAR scans of the past two projects. Uh, and um, also uh, we use uh, augmented reality apps for this for Ruvis Conti, we've recently done uh, that we commemorated the 60th anniversary. 
And it's, it's surprising how much 80-year-olds love using that technology. It's, like, it's, it's incredible. You'll be surprised. So you can do that a lot. And um, uh, we on to the master bar. The next and last final art project for Christo and Jean-Claude. It's, um, it's our final promise and our final mission. It was initiated in 1977. Uh, it's 150 meters high by 300 meters long by 225 meters wide. It's made out of 410,000 oil barrels. And uh, by volume, you can fit two great pyramids inside. Um, the construction of the mastaba will take four years, but it will be very sexily elevated in just two weeks, as you can see in this video. And um, we, as with all Christian Jean-Claude projects, uh, the mastaba is not uh, reliant on government funding. And since the estimated cost is around $400 million, we are really looking to a lot of innovative ways to do this, including NFTs, and, uh, and, and it's actually really simple math. If you make 410,000 NFTs for each barrel at $10,000 each, it's $410 million. So it's just a question of selling those NFTs. <laughs> and uh, we're still in the process of working. It's a little bit of foreign language to me. And luckily, I have a lot of people that are smarter than me doing with, dealing with that. And um, we need to um, really it's, it's one thing I really learned about this, but the most important thing about NFTs is one of the most important things is perks, which is utilities in NFT language. And the utilities, we, what we have for utilities is um, you can find through an augmented reality app your barrel. It's, uh, uh, you can also visit the site and visit inside the master, bar, which will be closed to the public. And you can also have a, um, the most, like, valuable thing is that actually the barrels need to be replaced in 12 to 15 years. So you will get your barrel when you have an NFT, in because the, when the barrels are replaced, you get your barrel. And um, this way, you it's a little bit like the cathedrals, how they everybody sponsored the stone in the cathedrals. So you get, uh, but this way, you actually get your stone at home. <laughs> and, uh, and, and also, we will have a, like a master in the metaverse, and crystal really like the really, as we called it, so you cannot compare it. But for the not really, we will have the master in the metaverse. And, but I would still recommend everybody here in Amsterdam to go see the Night Watch in the Rijksmuseum Museum and not just, just look at a picture of it. So, and, and just as we value institutions like the Rijksmuseum, Museum, it's like we really need to bring out that to the public and to have people confronted with public art and also uh, to dream, like cathedral thinking, there's a term cathedral thinking, which even if your term is four years or five years or six years, think beyond that, think beyond your lifetime to build things for the people that will enjoy and be there and it would strike the conversation and strike the, the, the passion for it or the, the way people, even if they argue, it's okay. It's actually better. They become part of the artwork when they argue. And um, it's, it really just think nothing is impossible. And you know, everybody asked Christian Jean-Claude, why? It's like, how can they have so much patience to do this for so long and so many refusals and so many things? And uh, they always answered, it's not a matter of patience, it's a matter of passion. Thank you. I overdid it a little bit. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>
but the metaverse is the digital version of it, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have the restrictions of the physical environment or the physicality of ourselves either. So it's a completely new type of world. Uh, to me, the metaverse is a digital dimension. So every one of you and everything around us has a trace of a data, like a ghost. As we begin to interact with each other, those ghosts come together to form a replica and a fusion of our world that allows us to interact in new ways. And that formation of a, of a market, of a cultural way of being, to me, that's the metaverse. So when it comes to city government, um, the digital twin is a very exciting new technology. Um, Salah, given your expertise in, in the in intersection of technology and construction, tell us about the concept of creating a digital twin, You know what it takes to build one and what it can do for cities in the built environment. Excellent. Um, so digital twin is a fairly new framework, and, and there is a lot of uh, still controversy of what digital twins are. Um, and it's easier to uh, describe as what it is not, what the components of a digital twin are, and then reflect into the, the use of digital twins that it's not supposed to be a veneer for what already happened, but it is a, it explains to you what is the cause and effect of the phenomena that you are seeing and, and simulating, emulating with your digital twins in order to make decisions and take actions uh, to improve from where you currently are. Um, and that way the digital twin is there to uh, expose uh, what the actions or non-actions have caused, what you're dealing with now, but then you can optioneer that what might your actions then um, derive into. Um, so that's uh, the use of, of digital twins and kind of the definition of them too, but it's, it's a digital version of the physicality and the processes that we are dealing with. Yeah, and so let's go into an example, Sean. Uh, your city of Wellington has been a leader in adopting this technology and in investing in digital twins. Um, can you tell us a bit about why you guys are using it and how you guys are using it? So for us, digital twins were an important way of understanding the evolution of a city government. This digital dimension can be harnessed to do things. So we live at the boundary Oh, we live at the edge of the world, but we live on a plate boundary. And what we have found is that by fusing sensors and citizens and awarenesses together, we can do things like rec uh, deal with major earthquakes quickly. We can restore native bird species and we can position ourselves for the sustained democratic decision making that's going to be needed to adapt to climate change. So we actually have two clips um, of examples of how you guys use digital twins. Um, I don't know if they're gonna tee that up somewhere. Uh, but why don't you walk us through these two clips and show us. So this is where we live, and this is what it looks like. This is that digital reflection I was talking about, and you can see the cars moving down the streets, uh, the lights of the day, and what this is is fused to the living heartbeat of the city. So for example, those are all the car parks, and if they're occupied at that moment, these are the volumes of people moving through the cycle lanes. It allows us to see the patterns that are made of people's lives. And if you think about cities, we're on a journey that's measured in those lives and those generations. And this digital dimension both creates new possibilities, but also helps see things that don't yet exist, like this new ra light rail line. It lets people feel the future, embrace the future. And it moves from that technocratic, how do we build the railway line, to that purpose of, what is this railway line for? How much carbon will it el eliminate? How much time will it save me? How will this help me be a better person in a better place? Was there another clip? Okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> those are where all the buses are at the moment. <laughs> um, I can see the number two's late. <laughs> um. So this, this is what we're investing in now. This is the underground digital twin. So we are scanning all of our streets, locating all of the underground assets. This is saving enormous amounts of money uh, as we position ourselves, because as that sea level there moves, the lifeblood of the city changes. It also helps us see things. This is, for example, is all of the barriers to accessibility that have been reported by wheelchair users. So we can fix little things that affect people's lives in major ways. 
and that's ultimately what the mission here is. We're not trying to mechanize the city. We've been mechanizing cities for the entirety of the 20th century. If we get this right, we can humanize cities. And we don't just build digital businesses, we build an entire digital economy with new rules that can be more just, more circular, and more importantly, something that we can be proud of to leave our children. I think a lot of people in this room are, would be really interested to know how exactly the digital twin can help us uh, drive towards uh, cli climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, um, more energy efficiency. Um, Salah, so how might this work? Good, good question. So um, like Sean was describing, that it's, it's about creating a, an entity that is federated entity, integrated entity of different data sources. So when we start planning a city and, and, and building digitally the city and, and building digitally the infrastructure and buildings, we might be using technology like building information modeling that has been around for a couple of decades now already. But then you can also integrate GIS technologies into it, IoT technologies when you are interested in different systems that are taking up physical infrastructure space in the city but then also connect the internet of actions that is the, is the human part in the city, all the end users, the reason why they are there, what are they there to do, uh, and how do you cater to the different experiences that they are needing for their everyday lives. And that way, you can actually start federating the data into understanding that what's ha actually happening in the city, uh, and not only trying to guess that what might happen, or create services and experiences that nobody wants to use. Uh, city is an ever-developing uh, built environment, but it's also a social environment. And now with the metaverse coming and with the digital twins, we have the third dimension, the digital environment at the tips of our fingers. Uh, literally, when thinking about the application of extended reality, for example, into our digital twins and metaverse experiences in city environments. So if we have ambitious goals of improving sustainability or improving people's everyday lives, we can set those goals and then run the simulation that what if, and ask the questions from the citizens that what if, what is it that is important for you? And then show them that if we implemented what they are asking for and what we are using their tax dollars or tax euros for, then we can show people that if we did what you are asking for, this might be the outcome or these might be the different outcomes. And that way, we engage people into uh, making the decisions about their future and the generations after that. Um, so the decisions that we are making today, they're going to have a lasting impact for hundreds of years. And when thinking about the application or creation of digital twins and metaverse and what comes after that, digital building life cycle is a framework that we should be adapting to so that we are starting to accumulate the digital truth whenever we are deciding to make changes into our physical environment. Uh, and that way we are leaving behind the digital breadcrumbs that are then used uh, for generations to come. I think one thing, if for people who here who are interested in adopting this technology within their cities, um, the market for our digital twins is so huge right now, right? It's growing. Um, what are your, for either of you, you know, what are your thoughts of, uh, as to how can cities make sure that they're not just building some flashy product, they're not just putting money into a company that's trying to sell them something, and they're building something that actually helps the people um, and helps their city move forward. So I think the most important thing to recognize is you, you can't buy a city-scale digital twin. What we are talking about is a new way of governing, uh, so new tool sets that need the rigor and the understanding of how they strengthen a democracy. We're not trying to build data-driven cities. We're trying to build sustainable, informed democracies. And so what that means is understanding those digital dimensions uh, in those tasks, that mundane, everyday thing that occupies public servants like myself. The other important piece of that is we all serve cities. We know that priority is a somewhat diluted term when it comes to budgeting. Everything is a priority. You don't have to do everything, you just have to do something. There is something in your city that makes it special. There's a story there that your citizens will automatically connect with. Do that. Um, my perspective, um, to an excellent point of view, is the public-private partnership. 
and leveraging the citizen developers that are already professionals. Um, we are talking about Generation Z and, and younger generations than that, that are digital natives. And, and those are the people that are very interested in what Industry 5.0 is delivering for them. Uh, they are very interested in the future of this planet and they are very interested and engaged in sustainability and uh, sustainable growth of societies, etc. So making the question about what's in it for them and making it very personal, but then allowing them to start creating different components or different applications, um, experiences, etc., that they can then create for their own use cases, their own needs, but share to the, the rest of the community. A and that way the city as the the big organization that is providing services for all can be the proud shoulders to leverage those uh, citizen developers to come forward and, and create something fabulous for everyone. And when you have a lot of data involved in, and new technology, one of the biggest concerns is always security and privacy. You're using a, a lot of data from the citizens, right? So um, from a so, sort of public engagement point of view and, and data security, you know, how do you ensure to your citizens, to your constituents that the data you're taking, the data you're using is, you know, being appropriately used um, and not used for surveillance and stuff like that? That's a good question. Um, when, when thinking about the, the cyber security and thinking about um, privacy and the collection of data, creation of data, ownership of data, usability of data. There, there is a lot of different things that need to be taken into account. But in in today's technology world, we need to have um, data governance uh, strategy and, and think about the digital core. That what technology are we actually using to govern the data, so that we have uh, a, a platform to collect all the data for, create the infrastructure where we are democratizing the data and, and then allowing the developers to build services on top of it and, and that way make sure that overall the, the data security is taken into account at, at the digital core level in, in that cloud level so that the, you don't have to uh, worry about it at every step of the way but it needs to be something that is kind of embedded into the DNA. And Sean, can you tell a bit Tell us a little bit about how you engage with your citizens using digital twins. So the, f the first thing to recognize is our citizens are learning about this alongside us. Th we've made mistakes and our data governance isn't perfect, it's constantly evolving. F one of the key conversations in New Zealand is around indigenous data sovereignty. The way we do things in European societies isn't necessarily the way things are viewed around the world. And what we're having to do is understand what does data governance look like in a collectivist environment, in an indigenous environment. And that conversation, I, I'm very mindful of it sitting here. The city was the headquarters of the VOC. The first waves of colonization into the new world were led by companies. And it's very important that particularly those of us who live in those places now understand that there is great benefit to engaging in this technolog technology, but we must not repeat the, the problems of the past. So, you know, there's so many opportunities with digital twins, and, you know, once you've built your robust model of your city, um, you know, what, what do you guys hope will be the future of digital twins, what we can do with it? Um, what are your thoughts about that? So l last night our government announced proposals for carbon regulation of agriculture. So quotas for, for farming. It's an enormous step on a country for a country that produces as much food as we do. If you look at that, we're going to need this kind of capability to understand the embodied carbon of buildings and to understand how these new invisible patterns uh, will fit over the patterns of the past. One of the things I'm particularly interested in is the systems of cultural memory. So as Pacific Islands disappear, how does this help maintain cultures and new lands? All right, well, thank you both so much. Thank you.
What's up, y'all? We feeling good? We good? You ever wonder if our digital twins are at a conference right now concerned about their analog twins messing everything up? I think about that all the time. Also, donut economics, way more delicious than trickle-down economics. Let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, I'm Baratunde Thurston, back again with another chapter of City Stories. Today, we're going to be in conversation with Nigerian artist Peju Alatiste. And to get a flavor of this magical work, let's roll the video first. Welcome to the Barclay Hall Industrial Complex. We're standing in front of my studio, the old powerhouse. The old powerhouse used to generate electricity to that building there, which was used to build ships. Um, and right beside us is the scrapyard. You can hear the machines. This is where all machines die and transition into an artist's heaven. So um, the noise is music to my ears. So come into my studio. And inside, this is where all the magic happens. Um, I'll show you some of my work. Uh, this is called uh, O is the New Cross. It's about um, neck racing. It's a mob mentality act where people, justice, jun jungle justice, where people are necklaced and burned to death without any form of trial. This is my, um, my rebellion against the mob mentality of four boys that were killed in Port Harcourt in Nigeria some years ago. These works are some of the works from the Venice Biennale Architecture 2021, yeah? And uh, this is what I'm working on now. This is, uh, this is not a new piece. It's an old piece um, that a client uh, damaged, and I'm trying to fix it. It's called Eve should, Eve should Have Stayed in Bed That Day. You know, she could have saved us a whole lot by not eating the apple, but yeah. This is it. <laughs> and then I'll take you upstairs for a chat. All right, are you with us, Peju? Doing a little, is this one of those moments where you're on mute? Are we doing that right now? We're gonna check the technicalities. Hello? Yes! Woo! <laughs> Nice to see you. Nice. Very glad to be with you. Nice to have you with us virtually. Uh, by explanation for the people here in Amsterdam, Peju is in Glasgow, Scotland right now. Uh, and so my first uh, question for you, Peju, is uh, what you doing in Scotland? You've, you're from Lagos. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> I'm here to make magic. I, I, I needed uh, to expand my studio. Um, so Lagos was getting a bit uh, small. And um, Glasgow is an industrial city. It's got great people. Um, the people here are just warm. They've got a big heart. And I just love it here. It's a great place to produce. I've never heard anybody refer to Lagos as getting a bit small. So congratulations on the size <laughs> of your vision. Um, can you tell us a bit about what makes Lagos special to you? Ah, oh, Lagos is, if you're an adrenaline junkie, that's the place to be. It's a fast place. Um, everyone is in a hurry to get things done. Um, so there's a type of energy there um, that I enjoy. It's, um, it's, it has a creative buzz. The art scene is really thriving. Uh, we're getting noticed, and uh, it, it, is, it is a great place to be inspired. Well, speaking of getting noticed, let's put up uh, one of these images that the, the team has. Can we get uh, the first image up to one? I want to talk about this. Oh, it's up on my left side here. Okay, so we've got these sculptures of flying girls. They're in London's Regent Park. That's what we're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, can you talk to us about the flying girls? What's the history there? And tell us about your, your sculpture. Okay, so uh, the sculptor up now is yeah. called Sim and the Glass Birds. Um, so it's in Regent's Park for the Freeze uh, sculpture. And 
So I had written a book called Flying Girls, and in the book, my protagonist is called Sim. Sim is a domestic servant at the age of nine. It is not an uncommon practice in Nigeria. Mm. And Sim is a child who um, labors during the day. She, she lives a parallel life in her dream world. So when she goes to sleep, she wakes up in a world of magic. She, where she sings, she, she, she can fly, she can talk to animals. I use uh, Yoruba folklore and Yoruba mythology to create this world of fantasy where she can escape into. And for me, it is um, important to do this, to be able to create that space where, um, I mean, it's a fictional space, but it's a space that children can go to if for, it's important to have that place where children can be children, you know? So I create that platform. And uh, bringing Sim to London uh, in Regent's Park, what, it, she's, she's like an ambassador for, for all young girls that find themselves in a situation that is not wholesome. It, it's not a place where children should be. A mythological girl in a fictional place represented in the real space of a park in London. How have the people there been responding to this work in the public space? Also, oh, that's really interesting because um, in the story, I, I have the stories of uh, Sim etched on the sides of the sculpture. And uh, each panel has, uh, tells uh, like a poem or like a short story about her journey in the alternate, in the, uh, alternate uh, reality. So in one of them, the yellow one, you can see there are two girls there and then the subsequent squares in the stainless steel is just the one girl. So it, the one that has the two girls, it's uh, Sim and a friend, an imaginary friend that, um, visits her in her dreams, and her name is Emiogo. So on the side where I've written the stories, Emiogo disappears from Sim's dreams, and um, Sim tries to find Emiogo back. And I get text messages from people saying, oh, you know, we found Emiogo. Tell Sim we know where Emiogo is. And <laughs> people write me messages about their dreams, about Sim. You know, so it, it, it's a funny way to connect to it. Um, but in other, in other ways, I mean, there are people that have talked to me about their experiences as children where I buy my paint in Glasgow. The man um, who manufactures my paint saw the sculptures and he, I told him the story about the work and he told me about um, his mother who grew up in a care system. And uh, he said he could really relate to it because at some point she... Um, tried to escape, but unfortunately, uh, she ended up doing drugs. Uh, that was her way of escapism. Mm. Um, and she passed away from the drug use. But he could relate to it. Anyone who has uh, a dream to be in a better position than they find themselves can relate to the work. And we all have those dreams. Do we have a few more stills of Peju's work we can show on the screen? Yes, yeah, so, so this is Flying Girls. The, this is the work that started it all. Um, this is a, a chapter in the book where Sim wakes up on the moon and she wakes up some shadows and they become friends with her. And they play with the birds and the butterflies. Uh, there's a portal that they're coming through. Um, this was shown at the Nigerian Pavilion in 2017 at the Venice Biennale. Peju, uh, the people in this room know how I feel about the clock uh, that we are subject to here. We are out of time. I just want to appreciate your time uh, for sharing with us a, a different virtual world that we can access through art in the public space, and congratulations on your success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peju Alatiste. Thank you. All right.
since Russian troops illegally invaded Ukraine, having for eight years illegally occupied Crimea and eastern Ukraine, Donbass. Yesterday, as we opened this very conference, a conference seeking to bring together city leaders globally. Thank you very much, Ali. That was great. Best practices, managing the many challenges we all face from global climate change to poverty to energy efficiency. Just yesterday, Russia launched 84 cruise missiles and 24 exploding drones at Ukraine, targeting 117 sites in over 15 regions, including 29 critical infrastructure sites, 35 private homes, four high-rise buildings, one school, and horrifically killing 19 people, injuring some 110. And these missiles continue this morning as we speak. The challenges for governance during all-out war in Ukraine are immense, from how to organize national security to ma managing massive infrastructure damage, movement and resettlement of some 7 million internally displaced people, sustaining an economy through all of this, ensuring food, energy, and other critical supplies as we enter winter, and where Russian troops have occupied land, now liberated by Ukrainian troops, managing the intense trauma of the atrocities, the war crimes that they left behind. How do mayors, the leaders closest to the people, manage through these extraordinary challenges? Well, we're going to show you a film from Western NIS Enterprise Fund to give you a sense of what we're dealing with. Please. Тридцять перше березня відвідав історію нашого населеного пункту всієї територіальної громади як день звільнення від російських орків, від російських окупантів нашими збройними силами України, наших населених пунктів. Hi, my name is Oksandr Sinkevich. I am the mayor of Mykolaiv. Before the war, Mykolaiv was a prospective city that for the last five years had only started to develop. For Ukraine and the whole world, it was the city of port. Today, Mykolaiv is a war. I'm sure our victory is near. Ukraine will win because truth is always win lies. по городу, уничтожают людей, живые массивы, инфраструктуру. При этом Путин же называет Чернигом, он неоднократно называл Чернигом, Чернигом колыбель православия. Так он и хочет уничтожить колыбель православия. Кирпінь утримав сили другої армії світа по кількості. Вісят відсотків, як мінімум, критичної інфраструктури знищено. Це дуже високий відсоток, але я впевнений, що всі разом ми дуже швидко все відновимо. Город Харьков гордился своими людьми, своим научным потенциалом, своей архитектурой, парками, скверами, всеми горожанами. Очень много разрушений, 25% жилого фонда разрушено, 100 школ разрушено, детские сады, больницы. Кроме того, очень много инфраструктуры разрушено, начиная от трансформаторных подстанций, котельных, водоводов. Все это ну, приходится восстанавливать. Do 
10 днів вони зруйнували все до попіла. Факт, що 90% інфраструктури зруйнувала Російська Федерація, бомбардувала лікарні, бомбардувала бомбосховища, вбивала мирне населення міста Маріуполя. 21 тисяча – це все військовий злочин. Це геноцид українського народу, Російською Федерацією, в нашому місті, в цілому, в нашій державі. І так буде, що місто було, є і залишиться українським містом. Гей, люди такі, люди такі, ось Mayor Anatoly Fedoruk of Bucha in Kyiv region and Mayor Andriy Sadovy of Lviv in western Ukraine. Ladies. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the rest of this session is going to take place in Ukrainian. So if you could please put on your headsets. They should be uh, in front of you. And on the right side, there is an up-down button. It should be on the number four, where you will hear the English translation, the number four. And on the left side, you'll have the volumes. Again, number four for English. Uh, good morning, our uh, mayors. Uh, uh, our uh, sincere gratitude for your participation, and we hope that you are in security. Uh, pan, uh, Mr. Fedorov, uh, liberation of Bucha from uh, uh, Russian occupation uh, revealed Russian crimes of war for uh, the whole world. And uh, the atrocities which were evident after the expel of Russian occupiers uh, touched upon uh, the people who were uh, uh, negligent to the uh, horrors of war. What uh, kept you alive? Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I believe that you will agree with me uh, that uh, uh, we had uh, many hopes for our citizens, for our cities before the 24th uh, of uh, February, but uh, our lives were uh, changed on that day. Uh, third, for 30 days of uh, Russian occupation of my um, city near Kiev, uh, uh, we witness uh, the deaths of hundreds of civilian uh, citizens, and uh, the majority of our civilian infrastructure uh, was destroyed during uh, this period by the occupiers. And we cannot forget and we cannot forgive uh, those atrocities. Sorry, uh, the sound the quality is uh, poor. And uh, we would like our people to enjoy uh, every moment of their lives. And uh, uh, I saw uh, the uh, compassion uh, in this conference uh, during the last two days, uh, and I'm very grateful to you. Uh, but we have to live on. Uh, 
Uh, uh, Mr. Federuk, how do you see the restoration, renovation, or rebuilding of the city of the Dolosmans? What are your priorities? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, it's infrastructure and how to raise the spirits of people. Uh, the spirits of people are kept up by the armed forces of Ukraine and uh, the world community who support us in our uh, struggle. Uh, I would like to address our colleagues. Uh, uh, you thought that uh, uh, the we thought that the war was somewhere in the eastern part of Ukraine, in the eastern part of uh, Europe. But I would uh, like to tell you that if uh, the Russian troops invade Ukraine, they would try to expand their influence on other parts of Europe. And I call upon you, uh, my dear colleagues, uh, to support us in our struggle that we have to protect our lives and uh, our freedoms and uh, to uh, be victors. Do we have a uh, mayor already? Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, are you okay? Uh, mayor Sadovoy, can you tell us uh, Lviv is a, a wonderful uh, city with uh, European, rich European history, and it invited uh, and uh, uh, made uh, homes for many uh, thousands of people who uh, were uh, forced to leave their uh, houses in the uh, war-afflicted areas. Uh, could you tell us about the difficulties uh, which you faced uh, during these difficult times? Uh, thank you for the invitation to be with you and for your attention to Ukraine and to our cities. Uh, Lviv is a unique city because 10 years ago we hosted uh, the UEFA World Cup, and it's a fantastic city. It's, uh, uh, during uh, the uh, war, uh, our uh, uh, city accepted uh, 5 million people of Ukrainians who passed through uh, our city. And uh, during uh, this war, we also accepted 13,000 of wounded uh, people, and we help of all of them. We uh, deal with their rehabilitation. Uh, last year, we had a, a resilience program, uh, still one month before the Russian aggression. We built an infrastructure to accept uh, the temporary uh, people. And yesterday we had an attack on uh, Lviv, and we lost uh, for several hours uh, water and electricity supply. But by the morning we repaired uh, all our infrastructure. And uh, uh, at this moment uh, we have uh, two missile strikes to, uh, to our infrastructure. Our uh, communal services uh, responded to this attack and went uh, to that area. What uh, Russia wants, it wants to destabilize us, to frighten us, but uh, it does not ruin our uh, will and will uh, win and be victorious on each uh, meter of our land. 
But we need your support. We need more diesel generators. We need stations uh, to uh, charge uh, our phones from solar. Uh, stations. Uh, we need some uh, uh, space to exchange our opinions and ideas. Many mayors come to uh, Lviv uh, to uh, show us their support. And uh, Lviv uh, is uh, located near the Polish border, and uh, we saw uh, your uh, support and will be victorious. We will overcome all the difficulties. You answered our uh, last question. Uh, Mr. Fedoruk and Mr. Sadovi. You have an opportunity to address hundreds of your colleagues all over the world. What support do you require today to Ukrainian cities, and how can we help you? Uh, Mr. Federer, please. Uh, during these critical uh, circumstances in which our uh, cities and our settlements are, any uh, support, any uh, aid uh, uh, will be helpful. Uh, uh, visits will be uh, significant, but uh, we uh, need uh, the governmental support uh, uh, and uh, will. Uh, overcome all uh, the enemies with your help. Uh, uh, please ad ask uh, your uh, uh, governments to provide Ukraine with a uh, uh, defense system because we protect democracy today. We uh, defend the right of communities to be free. We need uh, 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 vivid communications with you. Uh, please come to Lviv, uh, not through Zoom, uh, but uh, physically come to uh, Lviv. Uh, and uh, 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 at the moment, my purpose is uh, the uh, formation and shaping of the system of rehabilitation of the people who were wounded during this war. And I uh, would like to be grateful to you for your solidarity and for your support. Uh, our uh, profound gratitude to you all, and we wish you all uh, success.
Well, I hope you enjoyed your lunches, um, and we're really delighted to be here. Uh, I'm Dan Cass. I'm the Senior Vice President at Vital Strategies for Environmental, Climate, and Urban Health. Uh, I'm so excited today to introduce you to two mayors uh, who we'll be speaking with. Um, to my right is Mayor Chilando Chitangala from uh, Lusaka, Zambia, and hopefully, oh, there you are remotely, uh, Mayor Kostas Bokoyanis of Athens, Greece. So a quick hand of a round of applause for them. So these mayors are part of a network of 70 cities that we call the Partnership for Healthy Cities, a five-year-old initiative where each of the mayors that are part of this network has committed to do something about non-communicable diseases and injuries, something fundamental in the city that changes a policy uh, which can be demonstrated and hopefully scaled uh, to really help solve a critical problem of their choosing. Um, for example, cities are working to address cancer, heart disease, uh, uh, and other sort of leading causes of illness through changes in streetscapes, reducing uh, vehicular speeds, um, addressing the quality of food um, in public institutions. These kinds of initiatives are really making a difference. In 2019, uh, we had to pivot this program a bit, and we expanded it to include uh, supporting a COVID response. And each of the mayors uh, in this network was uh, able to do quite a bit around COVID. And so we're going to hear today about some of the work and the lessons learned from the mayor of Lusaka and from Athens about COVID uh, uh, and its impact on public health in their cities. Um, as you know, uh, more than 80% of all uh, uh, preventable deaths that occur in the world are from chronic diseases, from non-communicable diseases. Um, and uh, it's really critical that cities be positioned to address this problem. That was the goal of the, of the initiative, um, and we had an opportunity to, uh, we'll have an opportunity to hear a bit more about that. I also wanted to draw your attention to the fact that uh, sometime, I think today, there'll be an article appearing in The Guardian that'll uh, highlight some of the initiatives that are part of the, uh, part of the, um, the Partnership for Healthy Cities Network. So, I'm going to begin uh, with a first question to you, uh, Mayor Chilando. No doubt there were really critical lessons that were learned um, from your experience with COVID-19. I wonder if you could comment on how, as mayor, uh, COVID-19 has influenced your own thinking about public health and on how you think public health can go forward even post-pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, 2019-2020, I think for us it was 2020, and at that time I was uh, not mayor, because I became mayor like a year ago. So I was a chairperson of public health, so it meant that I was one of the frontliners to do a lot of sensitization and just go into the communities to make sure that they understand what, you, what is going on um, from the part of Africa that we're coming from, that I'm coming from. Uh, our first cases were like, our first case was like in March 2020, uh, but it took us some time to convince people and make them understand that um, it's really here. Yeah, because everybody was saying, no, we don't travel, so we're okay. But no, it's not about traveling. It's here, you already have the first cases, so we have to start. So uh, sensitization in communities was um, number one. Yeah, and then also we had to make sure that we had partners, so partnership was also very, very important. And then as a local authority, there is no way that we would have uh, managed just on our own. So we had to partner with central government, which was uh, Minister of Health. Yeah, Minister of Health and also other partners, like the way we partnered with uh, Vital Strategies on uh, making sure that our sensitization, which Vital Strategies, of course, had to help us fund, our sensitization in our communities reached the people by uh, not just uh, going out there to educate them, but also by making sure that the children that now stayed out of school for that time, by the way, we couldn't really do a lockdown, complete lockdown, because our economy would not, um, would not allow that. We come from an economy where you, you had to keep running. So we were not like other countries that had to you know, have lockdown or shut down completely. We couldn't have managed. People wanted that done but uh, leadership would not allow it. And I, I understood from the point that leadership was uh, coming from. But we did have to close some schools. 
most of the schools, especially where we had boarding schools stayed, but day schools had to close. And then uh, that meant that kids stayed away from, uh, from, from school. But um, when they started opening uh, slowly, we had partnerships that would help us do a lot of sensitization in schools as well, making sure that they have their water, they have hand sanitizer, they have their masks. And um, obviously we couldn't have afforded the disposable masks, so we had to use reusable masks. So we had to now call upon people from all directions to come up with initiatives of sewing cotton masks and then teaching our children how to wash them and reuse them. So all that was only possible we because we had a lot of partners. And then um, partners like uh, vital strategies also. Uh, I remember one of the things that I liked very much was when um, we had cartoon comics for the children just to teach them that, uh, you know, but looking at the book and seeing all those nice cartoons, they would learn that this is how you wash your hands, this is what you do, and COVID is here. So we had such initiatives. And apart from that, in our markets, very crowded markets, we had um, talking walls, they call them, talking walls where you had to draw up and uh, just remind people how to stay away, keep away, and uh, practice uh, uh, healthy, healthy protocols. Yeah, all the five protocols that were there, you know, you draw them on the talking walls, we call them. And we have uh, 38 words. So Lusaka is divided in 38 words. So each word had to have like two talking walls. So that was very good partnership. But then at the same time, uh, without government coming on board and helping us through, we would not have managed. And then civic leadership also was very important in that because for us, you will not stay home. You need to go out there and tell the people exactly what is happening. And um, uh, our people listen more to actually uh, civic leadership because we usually use a bottom-up approach where you talk to the people, do a lot of sensitization, and then you take it up. So it meant that uh, a person like I would have to go to the community and really convince them, like, look, these people are not um, just dying from um, alcohol abuse or malaria, which was, is common. Actually, it's we have COVID with yeah. us. So, you know, and uh, you, where in Africa, if you don't go for a funeral, then you're not mourning with the people. So we had to go out there. My, by the way, my, my, my city is 70% informal. So it means that um, the other 70% is just houses very close to each other. And then if you don't go for a funeral, it's like, they're not, you know, the person is not with us. So you yeah. have to explain to them, you don't have to do this now. There is no more. You know, when, you, when somebody dies in the house, please don't go anywhere near. This is the toll-free number. You have to call. Yeah. So there was a lot of sensitization that had to go on. But uh, as a council, we also introduced what we called uh, Green Schools, mm. a partnership where we, had, we have uh, like 58 schools in the district that um, we had to make sure that we do a lot of sensitization and also make sure that they follow the protocols, which is we are washing hands and so on. But then our partners now had to buy us um, wash basins. We had to get uh, the masks and so yeah. on. Okay. Then businesses had to close down. So that became a very big problem where businesses, and these are small businesses, barbershops, saloons, and uh, of course, um, the people that sell um, drinks, you know, so it meant that they, they, they had to close and then no business for them. But for that, we had help from uh, UNDP, uh, United Nations uh, Development Plan, who started giving um, uh, a bit of uh, social uh, ca um, capital. Yeah. Yeah, social cash, uh, ca um, cash transfer, a bit of capital for the people that had closed down the businesses because now it meant that they went on for a very long time that opening, but we had to control the hours as well. So we used to follow what South Africa used to do because it was next door and they had uh, a bigger crisis than us. So when they closed their bars and their work premises or just maybe they allowed two to three hours of work, would also do that after we see what is happening. But it meant that um, people uh, lost a lot of uh, yeah. money. But today, the outcome is that uh, because now we are open, there's a lot of uh, illegalities for people trying <coughs> to uh, get money from lost time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I'm hearing, I'm hearing you describe what some people call a whole-of-government response. So there's a, there was an infrastructure 
response to it. Communications was really critical. Mm -hmm. uh, you involved sort of schools and all of the other institutional uh, arms of government to really address this. I want to, and, and finally, I think the emphasis on the role of partnership. I mean, the Partnership for Healthy Cities, after all, is, is a partnership of its own with the cities, with Bloomberg Philanthropies, with the World Health Organization. So, uh, you know, I, I, it's nice that it's sort of emulated at the city level as well. Let me turn to Mayor uh, Boyacanes and ask you a, the same really question, like what, what has been the impact of COVID on how you frame public health uh, as a mayor and what do you think will be the sort of longer term consequences of it for your own thinking about promoting public health? Well, uh, let me begin by thanking you so much for the invitation. I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there uh, in person. Uh, flashback to 2020. I don't think that any of us actually expected that we would have to come to terms with a pandemic uh, such as COVID. The truth is that most of us were unprepared. Um, and the truth is, the sad truth, is that most of us um, had to work uh, at the time of crisis, uh, in a crisis mode, uh, taking each moment as it came uh, without having the opportunity back then to actually uh, indulge, let's say, in long-term planning. So uh, how, having said that, however, um, COVID did, I think, define our thinking. Uh, number one. Uh, we learned to put politics and partisans uh, aside, actually focus on data, on real analysis, uh, on vigorous discourse. And number two, we were able to build on, let's say, quote unquote, competitive advantage of local government. Local government is all about what's happening on the sidewalk. It's about uh, what bottom up rather than down, which meant that focus on the most vulnerable the most vulnerable communities. Those are usually left behind. Uh, we, so at the time, it's around the world actually advised the citizens to stay at home. Many Athenians, however, didn't have to move. So practically, uh, in a very short period of time, we created um, a homeless shelter that was able uh, to house uh, up to 400 Athenians in conditions of dignity. Uh, the good news, I'm happy to report that uh, this center, which is actually one of the biggest um, in Europe, is still functioning and uh, was actually signaled out by the World Health Organization as a best practice. At the same time, we covered a um, black hole in our city because what, what we didn't have was a shelter for homeless uh, drug addicts uh, who were forced to sit in the streets. Now, they were put given um, a new structure that could be able to regain uh, in a life and past two and a half three years um, over a uh, hundred of those uh, people uh, have actually moved forward um, uh, being able to liberate themselves um, from this curse um, at the same time we invested heavily in help at home which is a program uh, the idea was that we didn't want anyone who even people who are elderly or are living alone in their apartment feel insecure or to feel threatened, so practically, you know, they would call uh, someone at the stations and one of our people would come from their door, it could be something as simple as uh, from a supermarket, or it could be the need to actually have a test, it could be a medical injection, whatever, we would be there for them. And we also strengthened our, uh, um, our, our set uh, social work is what we call it, of the city. These are actually people, uh, groups, uh, teams of uh, social workers, um, doctors, who literally walk around the city and try to help uh, people who are sleeping uh, on the streets. Uh, in, in this, uh, we are hoping we are grateful with vital trust on Naloxone. Uh, Naloxone, for those of you who do not know, uh, um, literally a life-saving um, uh, medicine for opium overdose. Uh, now it's been legalized in Greece. So we actually fought hard for that, but we were able to pay the government, uh, and we have, and we feel that we can be much more optimistic about the future. Uh, thank you for that. I, I'm struck by the way in which prior efforts by the city, uh, especially with what re regard to the unhoused population that you're describing, sort of enabled 
uh, a better COVID response. What, what else, I know as part of your participation in the Partnership for Healthy Cities, this continues to be a population that you're really emphasizing. Uh, just very briefly, can you talk a little bit about what else you want to be doing in this population? But here's what's actually quite interesting. Uh, you know, uh, the Chinese say that a, cri a crisis is both a blessing um, and a curse. In our case, COVID was clearly also a blessing because we were able to move forward with these shelters during COVID. These shelters didn't exist before. So basically, in a very short period of time, working under the stress of a crisis, uh, we were able to actually cover, let's say, gaps in the social solidarity uh, net um, of our city. And now uh, we are building these uh, newfound institutions as we're not trying to bounce back, but actually to bounce forward, which means that they're trying to constantly um, enrich the services that they offer. And of course, at the end of the day, it's about um, lessening the number of people who are sleeping rough in the city. Uh, they are half right now in what they were uh, three years ago. Uh, I don't know whether it's realistic to actually uh, talk about uh, zero for this number. I think it's really ambitious. Uh, but as it's realistic to plan uh, that we can actually bring the number down to the 100, 120 uh, by 2025. Thank you for that. And then uh, you have the last question. In the, in the minute remaining, I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about your um, intended activity in the Partnership for Healthy Cities that isn't COVID related. Okay. Um, first of all, we have, uh, uh, we've been working with vital, uh, vital strategies on um, uh, safety for the children, yeah, safety, road safety for the children, because about 3,500 deaths in um, the whole country, 37% of that happens in my city. And uh, for, for the local authority, one of the things that we've done is really concentrated on the safety of these children. So um, about 70%, which is okay, maybe about 65% of the children go to school on their own. Some, uh, uh, some use public transport, but then others walk. So from the distance where uh, they, they drop off from the public transport to their school, it's a walking distance. So we have to make sure that th that distance covered mm -hmm. is safe for them. So we have uh, the paved uh, way and then make sure that the pedestrian crossing is painted and then you have humps. So um, we've worked with uh, Vita Strategies on two public schools where we, we did that and the outcome has been very, very good. And uh, we, we, we want to continue because um, it's important that we safeguard and the lives of the little children, the small children, especially the ones are, who are 16 and below those are the ones that are very prone and um, very yeah. vulnerable to such kind of traffic accidents. Yeah. So my office is uh, working with uh, with um, uh, health cities, and I'm hoping that uh, they can uh, come back and uh, help me more to achieve this in the city. Well, thank yeah. you both for your leadership and your inspiration and in helping your cities get through COVID. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. So good to have all of you here with us. I hope you're enjoying it this afternoon. Uh, what we want to do for the next 20 minutes or so is inspire you. And to do that, I have inspirational leaders, thinkers of a new way of seeing things in cities. So I hope you will really uh, en enjoy the next few minutes. I have Amanda Burden and also Andreas Kipar. Uh, I'm sure you will be familiar with their work, but let me start with you, Amanda, because this is all about immersive nature in cities. And we come to this two years after the pandemic, and we're gonna have images that we're gonna share with all of you. Hopefully that will get you inspired to get those creative juices flowing, and we'll talk about them. But in your words, what is immersive nature? Well, I think you can begin to see it on the screen. And it's something that people maybe haven't imagined, maybe haven't thought about. And this the afternoon, I think we're going to talk about why, how important it is. But if you see it, if you can't imagine it, you can see it, then you will want it. Then you will ask for it and then it will happen. 
So we are going to brainwash you with immersive nature. Yeah, today. we're going to greenwash <laughs> <laughs> yes. their minds. This is in Essen, Germany, and immediately once you look at it, uh, you begin uh, thinking about Essen perhaps in a different way, because I always think of it as an industrial region in the rural area. Um, but, you know, we do come to this after the pandemic. Maybe it's the first time that you're all getting together after a number of years. So it's unique in that aspect. But also, is designing open spaces different after COVID? Do you want people to think about it differently? Yes, and first of all, open spaces, public open spaces are of course key to making a great city. But the trauma of the pandemic has really changed and what we're needing from them. Citizens are looking now for greener, more expansive spaces. Uh, perhaps not your traditional parks and your parklets, but healthier, lusher spaces, places where they can get closer to nature. Uh, and one of your projects as well, if anybody is not familiar with Amanda's work, uh, but I think you probably are, uh, is the High Line in New York, which was something that was so transformative and of course rezoning that city um, as well. So I want to come back to some of the aspects as well, the beneficial aspects uh, of projects like that. But you, Andreas, you know, you've talked about really radical change and that public space needs to be connected to a new kind of nature. Uh, well, we have the high line behind us Why? there. Um, what do you mean by that, a new kind of nature? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, first of all, uh, to be here. And uh, obviously, as a gardener, as a landscape architect, we are, we are so uh, well trained uh, uh, to, to deal with, with plants, uh, planting trees and so on. But the new kind of nature is a, is a new kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. We are uh, mainly looking for, uh, for a new kind of relationship with our urban soil, with uh, the cycle of uh, water and uh, uh, with our biodiversity in the city, bringing back nature into our cities. That is, that is something really important. And um, I wonder if, uh, if it will be possible after COVID, mainly after COVID, to create a new kind of uh, typology uh, in our cities, uh, a garden, a park, a boulevard, a square, everything fine, but then free nature. Free nature for free, open public space. So that is what uh, we are mainly looking for. And I know these mm -hmm. images will kind of help us think about uh, changing perhaps the way we look at things, but, but what are you looking for, Andreas, with that shift that you talk about from the previous thinking? Uh, well, well, we are we are now understanding everybody. I, I feel more and less, and also yesterday we heard it here uh, uh, that it's not enough to make business as usual. We need and we we try to find out a radical change. So be radical. We don't have time. They taught me, but on the other side, time to act is now. So uh, what can we do? We, can, we need to do something very radical and uh, radical makes break it up, break it up so much asphalt in our cities, so much concrete in our cities, bring the green into our buildings, not only on the roof, but into the buildings. So there are so much opportunities uh, to do the same things, but in another way. So more radical, showing what does it mean when nature grows up. And we feel so well connected to nature when we can see by daily, daily working what happened in our cities. And it will be not only a, a lovely park, we have a lot of lovely parks, but it will be something else we can see. A new ethic aspect, I think, needs also a new aesthetic aspect. Uh, but do we know, uh, for example, Amanda, about the lasting <coughs> positive effects on the individual? Because it's great to see some of these grand projects and they definitely change the urban landscape. But what about the individual? Well, I think we heard uh, that a little bit about that yesterday during the panel that you moderated. But we know, we instinctively know, and studies have shown uh, that nature, being immersed in nature, is beneficial to our health and well-being. We know it lowers our stress level, it increases our productivity, improves learning, um, it even uh, increases our recovery rate mm -hmm. during, uh, during illness. 
Um, but it also, the whole idea of immersive nature is also, and we want to hopefully talk about this too, important to our city's health and well-being as well. well. Well, let's talk about that because I think the first pushback probably uh, that people might have is like, oh, hang on, this looks amazing, but it's going to be too expensive. And what is the economic rationale or benefit for cities um, and, and how they might, I suppose, prosper as well I in whatever respect? Well, we heard a lot about this during the today and yesterday which is that cities have never been under greater stressors, and we know what they are. And there are the stressors, really, they're you know, um, existential threats uh, from the climate crisis. And we know it's extreme heat, and it's flooding, and torrential flooding, and sea level rise, and, uh, um, and pollution of our... It can contain our rainstorms. It can eliminate heat or reduce heat and fires. Uh, it can cool our streets and can actually clean our waterways and our air. And we're just not talking about trees. We're talking about what you see on the slides. This is radical, as Andrea Soe says, radical, deep, immersive nature within cities. And that's what's radical. It's not on the outskirts. It's bringing that within cities. And it's worth it because, uh, you know, cities are going to have to prepare for, so these investments are going to prepare cities for climate-related events. And if cities did this collectively, they oh could yeah. collectively, more and more cities do that, then they could repair the planet altogether. Yes, indeed, one, one city at a time. I'm just looking at Bangkok there, which is also <laughs> a place that I visited, but oh. I remember the heat and the concrete is yeah. what <laughs> I remember. What do you think when you see that picture, Andreas? Well, I think immediately about uh, uh, reconnecting people with nature. We are nearby, so nature is not far away, it's not outside. In our 50 minutes, it is, it is nearby. It is in our own community, so it creates a certain kind of ownership. And, uh, and by the way, it's, uh, it's a really important aspect uh, in uh, climate adaptation. So it seems uh, like a rain garden, it seems like a biodiversity garden. It seems something that can change day by day. And, uh, and by the same way, we, 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 are, we can go in. And let me say, that is something, uh, maybe the whole the things we learned in the past, everything's fine and it's good to see, but then we need to have, in our future cities, we need to have also open space for nature coming out by themselves. So that is what, what I call in a German word a uh, little bit like rustical, so very, very strong and people want uh, to feel it, that is identity, that is the soil urban identity. It's so interesting that you say that because I am, the panel I did yesterday was on loneliness uh, and urban nature and uh, one of my guests, Christian, was bringing up this sense of belonging yeah. and, and you're talking about ownership, so there's definitely that connection there as well. But I know you're talking about being a disruptor, Andreas. I think that's what I'm hearing. How do you create or get people on board, perhaps people in this room, with radical change? Because it can be difficult, scary sometimes to try and, and make that happen. I know Amanda's not scared of it, but go uh, on. <laughs> more or less, 89% uh, of European citizens uh, uh, like to have a new relationship with nature. So nature is so important and they ask this kind of new relationship. But they don't, maybe the participation will be so important. So Jan Gehl taught us that first people, then space, then architecture. So I normally, we, we try to start with people needs and then with a new vocation of old spaces. New vocation. And at the end, we will have the best dress code. But at the end, so body, soul, and then... And Amanda, you must have come up against that as well, particularly a high-density city that we're talking about. People must always often say housing first and yeah. that there's not time or space <laughs> or energy for some of these amazing, <laughs> look at that in Vancouver, that we're seeing. What would you respond? Well, first, you should never have to choose between the two. They okay. should have both of those necessities. But I think um, when we think about it, we remember that during the pandemic, 
many people have deserted cities. Yes. And didn't come back. So. And they, this is true. And they went to places that destinations that were healthier and calmer and greener. And um, bec and both because of mobility and because of technology and remote learning, remote work, yeah. uh, people can actually choose which city gives them the best quality of life, which mm -hmm. best meets their needs. So cities are going to have to compete now for health and well-being, quality of life, protection from climate-related events, because um, people are, it's, it's going to be, it's, it is going to be a competition. Um, but cities who actually invest in na immersive nature within cities are going to have a better chance of attracting newcomers and keeping their citizens. And it may turn out that people actually choose one city over another for this kind of nature that you see. And that is radical thinking because before it was kind of the city held the power, but now you're telling me that the people might hold the power over the city. Yes, the city can't lose their people. Yeah, yeah. that's what it's about. And, and that maybe is a crucial point that uh, from the city we, we, we get to an urban landscape. That is completely different. In a city, normally we think about stress, we think about uh, uh, working Fishing. hard and so on. So in the urban landscape, we feel, uh, first of all, we feel a little bit well. And uh, uh, we, we find out our own horizont. And everybody from us want to reconnect themselves, our own nature, with something that's growing up in a public space. So public space is not only for being there to service our own business, but public space more and more gets a platform for a new urban nature. So we, that is a healthy city, that is a human uh, uh, being city we are looking for. So I'm thinking you're seeing some of these pictures, look at that from Vietnam, uh, oh. Golden Bridge, incredible, <laughs> being held in the hand, citizens being held in the hand of that city. Um, what about the people who live in the city or maybe the people that are in this room? What tools do they have to try and I don't know, be a part of this process to make it happen? Well, first of all, they have to feel this importance. And I think okay. m probably most people in this room today went through an experience during COVID where you wanted to be in a park more or whether you wanted to be um, uh, close to small beauty, um, and maybe where you took your time um, to, to take your time. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that there is something that happened during COVID where we feel this, it's almost a primal need uh, for the healing power of nature. And I think this is something that has to be part of the conversation and part of these images that you say that this is what we have to have in our city and anything less than that feels inadequate. Which is amazing because I think some of us might be looking at these images going, that's amazing, but I don't know if that would happen in my city, even that it's almost outside the realm of imagination, but it's not, says it's Amanda. Not. <laughs> uh, Andreas, what would you be advising people that want to make it happen? Well, uh, first of all, listening, listening. Uh, you, you all know that uh, urban gardening was, uh, was a good trend. Uh, uh, urban agriculture starts uh, to come in, but then normally, what are we doing? We, we make a regulament for everything. But at the end, in our cities, we need free space. Free space for nature means free space for people. So that is, that is what we need to break. We have a lot of asphalt we don't know, we don't uh, 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 use in our cities. So I think the first will be uh, the best. So be radical and let's break it. Break Let's down the break asphalt it. <laughs> and build something new. If you, if yeah, you build, build it, they will new. come. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk, I want to end just talking uh, and feel free uh, uh, to pop in on uh, any other point you want to make. But I think uh, on hope, uh, because I find this also inspiring. Do you feel hopeful that cities can get to this point that you're talking about, Amanda, in a cash strap time? You know, all the headlines seem to be on lack instead of abundance. Well, there's many cities that are doing this, and you've seen the pictures of some in Thailand. Look at Thailand. the Bronx River. Exactly, <laughs> and the Bronx River. <laughs> and Thailand and Singapore and Dubai. And um, I think that this is going to be something that um, will be something that cities want 
they need to they need to invest in, but they understand that there are all of these things we've just talked about. It's the personal need during health, mm. for health reasons, for personal reasons. It's the city's need to fight the climate events, and each one of those climate events can be addressed by this really intense, immersive, expansive nature. And finally, it's what city do people want to go Live to? In. What do they yeah. want to? Where do they want to stay? And what's that quality of life? So, is this, as it's part of the conversation and demand, be, it's going to, cities are maybe going to have to radically adjust their priorities and their spending plans. Radical change for cities. Your last thought there, Andres. Are you hopeful? Well, uh, after all, I uh, am here. So, I'm really hopeful, and uh, United Nations are with, with us all hopeful because last year they bring out the nature capital accounting. So while we are sitting here, in our cities we produce nature, not only in our national parks, not only in our gardens, but street by street. So let us be hopeful together and uh, break it together by nature capital accounting. And that can be some new part in our own story that, uh, uh, that also other people, not only we as a gardener or landscape architect, uh, try to understand what does it mean that nature is not only a luxury, but nature is something we need day by day. Essential, radical thinking. Essential. Thanks so much to Andrea and Amanda. Thank you. These are my people, so, you know. <laughs> Push up my glasses. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with some of, I think, the world's leading data uh, folks, da uh, chief data officers. Um, we did a poll earlier today, so thanks to everyone who responded. And we um, asked you all how many of you come from cities where there is a chief data officer. About 40% of you said that you have a chief data officer in your city. Uh, about 30 seven percent of you said that you don't and then i think which was more surprising for me about a quarter of you don't know um, and if you don't know your data chief data officer um, you should find your chief data officers <laughs> they are really important people um, and never more important than they have been over the last several years chief data officers became so critically important during covid because they were helping navigate some of the toughest decisions that we had to make as cities. They were at the center of those decisions about whether or not your economies were going to be open or closed, how we were going to deploy scarce resources. Chief data officers rose to the ranks of being part of the mayoral senior team in such a defined way over COVID. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about how that happened. And, and, and Grace, I wanna start with you. Um, and I would love to hear from you about your experience during COVID and the, and the way that your role evolved. Absolutely, I mean, I think I'm gonna take you back to the end of February, 2020, beginning of March, 2020. We knew that containment had failed and we would have to move to a mitigation strategy. But what did that actually mean? How are we gonna be able to make the right decisions? And in cities like Louisville uh, that are data driven, the question was, oh my goodness, where is this data? So one of the first calls I made was in fact to Beth. And I said, Beth, <laughs> you guys have this amazing dashboard, but it's only at the state level. That's not gonna help us. Now, Louisville does have an advantage. We are a consolidated city county government. And that meant that our public health response was in fact Louisville Metro government's response. But because the, the, the data was aggregated at such a high level for us, um, we had no choice but then to build it ourselves. And I think, again, just looking through those times, the chief data officer role was, again, a, a, always critical importance for Louisville, but it became elevated into the topmost senior level position. In fact, um, we leveraged the FEMA's um, incident management team structure to bring a whole of government approach. And so the chief data officer became the head of the planning section. That's how important that role was, which meant that subunits such as the situation unit that did all the data engineering and the analytics 
for both our internal and our public dashboards were again elevated into this senior level role. And it was data that was being used on the inside and, and we were all using that data, whether you were deciding whether you were going to the grocery store, whether you're gonna wear a mask, how you were gonna engage in public life, that data became critically important. Ming, talk about what it felt like at the national level. You were leading an effort you know, in one of the countries that was at the sort of in, in the middle um, of really those early um, responding moments. So talk a little bit about your work and how it unfolded. So roughly January, February time, we were all brought together to say, okay, we want a single data source for government. So Downing Street, as well as local government, as well as health, as well as research. So we had to gather data together for all those purposes. And the data that we gathered was both mobility data, where the incidents were happening, but we had to then use that data to project out um, vulnerabilities. So we, you know, government wanted to make sure that we had a list of people that were most vulnerable to the disease so that we could support them. So we made that data available. And to do that, we had, we had to use extensive health data that we already had nationally, but augment it locally um, with demographic data, uh, kind of place-based data in terms of um, inequalities and you know, the actual index of um, health, as well as index of you know, um, deprivation, and very much bringing all those data sets together, as well as how many people are actually going into hospital we were able to support both the daily kind of Downing Street um, announcements and where things were, build the public dashboards, but also, in, really importantly for us, make sure the hospitals and the local authorities actually had access to the data to manage the, the transition locally. Because the virus happened very differently in different regions, and the way that we ended up capturing that data allowed us to create models that were predictive so we could actually say where it was moving, how uptake was taking, and actually forecast how many people were actually going to end up in the hospital in beds. And so you had all that standardized at the national level, which made it easier to deploy resources, it made it easier to help support local efforts in recovery and, and really I in reaching out. Not the experience that we had in the United States. Um, and, and, and so we'll talk a little bit about that, but I, I also think that because it wasn't our experience in the United States, the data was so easily gamed, it was easily politicized, it became a, a big component of a rising and I think a very rapidly increasing distrust of government. And so Justin, talk to me a little bit about your role in Baltimore and how it played out in terms of trust and what you think the impact that the data itself had on this sort of, this narrative that we know we've all been sort of up against around trust in government. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough moment to be sure. Um, you know, we speak often of the, the attack on truth with, as though it has a capital T and that there is one truth to be attacked. Um, but um, by the same token, we invite our residents to, to speak their truth with a lowercase t, um, you know, which kind of presumes that everyone has their own truth. Um, it's, it's a difficult moment to be sure, and I think um, chief data officers um, have to be there to help facilitate that conversation because it's somewhere in the middle, right? Um, the data, we, we know our data are, are often biased. The ways in which we use data can be problematic um, or unethical, or they could be useful and helpful. Um, and so that's, that really ought to be, and, and that's why the chief data officer ought to be um, you know, a senior role, someone, someone who can advise and, and help discern um, right from wrong, um, and, and um, like I said, kind of facilitate those conversations so that we can, you know, we can't make decisions unless we have some kind of um, mutually agreeable, um, you know, truth, <laughs> quote unquote truth, um, some kind of common understanding of the world around us. And I think chief data officers have to be there to, to help navigate that. And a lot of that is sourced in public policy and in public health policy. Uh, and so when we have public health systems that are set up uh, in a way that can rapidly deploy information, that can help shape those conversations. I think in Ming, in your experience, very much so you were able to, you know, we knew comorbidities were gonna be incredibly important to track. In the United States, our comorbidity data is on a two year lag. Uh, we get data that's been processed, that's really difficult to access. Not the case, and so you were able to take that. Talk a little bit about kind of the benefit of having a centralized approach and some habits around data uh, at, at a centralized federal level. 
yeah, to be clear, we have comorbidity data based on patients that come into hospital. We don't have all the primary care data in one place nationally, but that was a benefit of federating the infrastructure that we were giving was actually to say, here's the data we hold on people with one long-term condition, two long-term conditions, whatever, whatever that comorbidity was. Now test it, use it, augment it with your local primary care data to make it better. And the investments that we're making now is really to make sure that we get both sets of data in one place to make it freely available for those that need it. So for instance, when we had monkeypox, we were able to build on that data so that we actually could identify what, what communities to work with and actually where we were most likely to see the spread. So not just for COVID, we, we really want to build back better and use that information for other things like screening and, and other vaccinations and immunizations. And bringing in some more of that Im information that c does come from the community. Yeah. So it's very clear that if you make that data available and share it, it gets better. So data that's not used and polished and processed and it's lagging, nobody really cares about it. Data in the hands of the people that need it to use day to day gets better because they, they will use it and make it better. What we need to do nationally is facilitate that capture of that local improvement so that you have a closed loop feedback system for data. Yeah, I, I'm just like so a little jealous of the sort of build back better uh, notion because what we're experiencing is really kind of a, a, a gut reaction to a lot of where we are right now in the pandemic in the United States of let's try to get the toothpaste back in the tube. Like let's, we're, we're seeing states that are taking down their data reporting infrastructure. We're seeing federal government that's also stepping back from reporting. So let's, Grace, hear from you, like, what are we gonna learn? What are these lessons learned? And how, how can we preserve some of the new skills that have emerged from the pandemic around data, some of the leadership skills that have, alert, that have emerged? And, and are we going to be in a situation where we're gonna try to return to some um, earlier state? Are we actually going to evolve the practice of using data? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Beth, because I'm, I'm very concerned. I'm concerned by the actions at all those different levels. And in part because, um, you know, it, it costs money, right? It, there's funding challenges around sustaining things at this level, but if you get right back to it, what did we learn? We learned we were really lacking in surveillance from a healthcare standpoint. Um, a lot of the data sources we were talking about just now, in fact, are all lagging indicators. Um, the city worked really hard, as did other cities, to find leading indicators, one of which, one of the most powerful tools, and we had strongly had a hypothesis around this, but it was borne out by the pandemic, is in wastewater epidemiology. You know, the city had made a, a really strong bet that that would help us get ahead of the spread. Um, and, and sure enough, it did. So um, finding these no new sources, building capacity, having teams that can respond, uh, not, not wait around to be built up, and then finally, just the time it takes to build these data tools. I mean, my, my team is in the process of sunsetting our COVID-19 dashboard, in part because there is a mismatch in timing between when the CDC puts out their county level information versus us, and it's causing a very big communication challenge in our community. Um, so if, if our school districts, if other you know, journalists are gonna be looking at the CDC dashboard, then it's time, it's time for us to sunset. It's, it served its purpose, right, back to the whole, if we had it in the beginning, we wouldn't have had to build it. But at the same time, we recognize there are other sources of information that continue to help serve as that canary in the coal mine leading indicator. And what I'm concerned about is that as some of our funding sources have dried up, other funding sources will dry up. And eventually we will be back to where we started, which is with really nothing. In terms of data infrastructure, in Justin, data. what's the experience in Baltimore and, and what do you think those lessons learned are that you're gonna be hopefully carrying forward? Right, um, I think probably quite a number of folks in the room can relate. I mean, at the, at the beginning of COVID, we built countless dashboards. Everyone wanted some kind of dashboard and then it wasn't just pertaining to public health da data, but you know, because everyone was going remote, we had to understand the city's operations a bit better and so, the thing I got asked for the most was, was can we build a dashboard or can we collect data that we don't have? Um, if you look at most of those da dashboards now, they, they are defunct or not being used or both. Um, so there is this question of, of how to make these things sustainable. And I think one of, the, one of the issues with asking for a dashboard in the first place um, is it kind of jumps to a solution. 
um, what we ought to be asking chief data officers for is for decision support. Um, don't tell us you want a dashboard. Um, tell us you need help making a decision. Um, I, I think that's, that's one part of this is that, um, you know, city leaders ought to be asking for information and seeing their chief data officer as someone who can help them with the policy decision. I, I was speaking with other chief data officers just the other day, and I, I continue to be struck by the, the amazing um, breadth of experiences that people in the data world have. Data science is only 15 or so years old. Everyone has come into this from, from other disciplines. A lot of it is, a lot of those folks are not necessarily STEM, it's, it's, it's policy, um, it's, it's economics. Um, and so you've, you've got a, a brain there that can help you solve problems and make good decisions and it's not just about maintaining dashboards. And the other, one, one other thing I wanna mention though is, is you know, every, every so often someone comes along and says something so pithy and poignant that it sticks in your head. And yesterday, um, when Dilla Thomas said that, that you know, if you explain the history of something, you can't help but respect it, um, I think we need to um, apply that to data as well, that dashboards don't have, always have the context and don't always tell a story. And what chief data officers need to help do is, is tell a story around the data because that's what motivates people to, to change. It's what makes, it motivates people to, to make this decision. So um, I, I also think that's a key responsibility for chief data officers. And if you have a chief data officer that isn't telling you stories and isn't communicating with that in mind, um, you might want to have a conversation with them <laughs> about it or, or find someone who can tell you good stories because yeah. that's, that's how to motivate people to do things. Yeah, I think the translational role is really key. And I think oftentimes, you're right, we get pu pushed in these sort of malicious compliance. Here's your information. Now let us go back and do our, our work. Um, tell us a little bit about sort of what you think is going to grow out of this, but also about how do you take your data from a translational perspective and have it lead policy. I think that that's something that you're in, in a unique position to be able to Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I totally agree with um, Justin here. What we've done is we've stopped answering questions with dashboards. We've said actually, what's the decision you're trying to make and what data do we need to bring together for that decision? And then how can we help you build the tools and the workflow that helps you take an action, see the action, that becomes your dashboard, <laughs> and then actually close that loop. So everything we do now is really either for the frontline operational tooling or decision support, either in pr predictive, proactive modeling that then creates a question around what you're trying to do. And the way we've brought the business together is really we've created the business process. So during the pandemic, what we had was a daily touch base with my team and the incident support team. They took the data from the models other surveillance data that they had and then make a, made a decision of how to set the system to tell what people what to do. That was incredibly useful and that's what we're doing now for winter. We're creating what we call control centers which are live dashboards but very much about managing flow of patients through different systems, joining those data sets up but actually creating the workflow so that if you want to create um, flow for a patient, you need to look at the handoffs and you need to have those messages going to each part of the system between voluntary sector, local authority, care homes, social care, making sure everyone sees the same thing. They can then best manage the patient or the, or the citizen using that data. So that's very proactive and much more enjoying, enjoyment for the teams, which then attracts more people. And that's how, you know, actually, and then you uh, attract people that can actually talk about what you're trying to do because you're no longer just saying, here's the facts. You're actually doing something with the data. So that's been our journey and we're investing significant amount of money to, to take that forward as a vision. Well, I want to thank all of you for being such great leaders in this space. <laughs> um, Ming, Justin, Grace, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. all so much for being here and you all for being here as well. Um, we've heard a lot over the past couple of days about 
the exciting, innovative work that cities are doing around the world. Today, um, right here, we're here to talk about how the proverbial innovation sausage gets made, supported, and funded, and implemented. Um, Lamia, I'd love for you to get us started. Um, you are the director of the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, um, and you've been doing a lot of research on how cities can build capacity to launch innovative projects, um, how those projects can build resident well-being, um, and some of the work that's still to be done to, to help build that capacity. Um, but before you, you dive into your research, I'd love for you to just tell us what does innovation mean um, at the local level? Great, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and good uh, afternoon, everybody. Well, basically, innovation I I is a concept that we know very well. You know, it's about uh, producing a new product or a processes that differs significantly from previous one. But when it comes to public sector innovation, it's very important that these new product and processes actually um, deliver uh, social value or societal values. That's the basics of what we call public sector innovation. And uh, a lot of things have been doing at the national level. At the city level, of course, there were a lot of things going on, but we have seen that this concept has really accelerated with COVID because overnight, many cities around the world, they have to engage into uh, new working methods to problem solving. Uh, linked with the, the pandemic. So since uh, 2017, we have joined uh, forces with Bloomberg Philanthropies, and we have uh, built together a comprehensive uh, program to map innovation capacity of cities. Uh, we have done a number of things. We have conducted a survey of uh, 150 cities from around the world. We produce uh, two reports, and by the way, I'm going to offer you one. <laughs> I'm making a little bit of publicity. Here you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we produce a, a, a checklist of uh, actions to help cities building these uh, innovation capacities. And also, we started to look at whether they are correlation with well-being outcome, bec because this is the uh, ultimate uh, objective. So pre we produce 10 rec basic recommendations to make sure that everything we do in a city uh, has really uh, impact on, on, on well-being uh, of all its, uh, their residents. So let me just flag some five key uh, big messages. So the first one is, well, investing in public sector innovation is really good business. Why? It's because our research found that uh, life is better in cities with high public sector innovation capacities. They perform well on all dimensions of well-being, access to services, safety, access to health and education, and life uh, satisfaction. Second message, uh, having the, ri the right staffing and structure really matter. And we, we know that mayoral uh, leadership is essential. You need to have a strong leadership from the mayor. But having a dedicated staff uh, to innovation really is important to create a, a culture of innovation. And even better if you have a unit. And, and, so, and we have seen that in some cities, some cities have unit under the, uh, the authority of the mayor. Um, but investing in skill is important, but investing in skills beyond this unit or this dedicated staff is super important across the board because we are talking about creating uh, a culture of innovation in all city departments, not just in one part. Third message, important to uh, successful innovation is collaboration and experimentation. Collaboration, of course, across different uh, departments, different uh, units within the city administration to avoid the silos approach and having a more holistic approach to make sure that we engage into transform transformational change uh, for urban development models, but also co-creation with uh, citizen, very important uh, aspect that we have seen, and experimentation, which means that sometimes we have also to celebrate failure, something that is common in the business sector, but in the public sector, we tend to uh, uh, incentivize uh, you know, uh, failures. Fourth message, funding. Uh, funding, really, what matters is not to have exorbitant uh, amount of funding, Sometimes innovation comes very, very tight uh, amount of money, 
but what matters is to create a sustainable funding mechanism, which means you have to engage in partnership. We can go back to that. And last point, you have to take evaluation very seriously. You need to have a uh, you know, dedicated goal and monitor uh, the implementation. And we have seen that, for instance, 50% of the city that we survey, they do have a strategy, but only 16% conduct a systematic evaluation of what they're doing. And today, we have been talking about the last two days about the importance to rebuild trust toward governments, including local governments. So evaluation and, uh, and uh, monitoring are really essential. Mm. And we have two representatives here from cities that have been um, achieving a lot of things on that checklist that you just mentioned. Um, and both of them were recognized by the Europe European Council on Innovation for their work. Um, Derek, I want to start with you. Um, you, uh, under your term as the executive manager of the Dublin City Council, um, you were recognized as um, one of the Europe European capitals of innovation in 2021. I'm wondering if you could just talk about what that prize even means and um, what it's allowed you to do at the local level since receiving that funding and that you know, international recognition. Perfect. Th thanks, Sarah. Um, well, just to echo a lot and underscore a lot of what Lamy said. I've never met Lamy before, but I was agreeing, agreeing furiously with you when, you when you were saying there. So a lot of the stuff that Lamy said, like, it's what we're trying to put into effect. So I in the first place, the benefit of being recognized by the award, uh, I'd say, is it allowed us to deliver upon our vision to create a dynamic and sustainable Dublin. And also, we have a goal as well to embed a culture of innovation across the organization, the whole organization, as opposed to one or two sections. So that's very much tying, what, what, tying in with what Lamy said. The second thing is then, um, it's a self-actualizing process. Mm -hmm. Success breeds success. And we found that it, by the recognition of, uh, of the war, that the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem that we have, that between the tech, between the, the startups, between uh, the citizens and between government, that it, it's, a, it's, it's a recognition of their effort. And, but it also, it helps us um, portray a positive image to the outside world to say, Dublin City is open for business, it's open for collaboration, and it attracts more success. Thirdly, and, and following on from that, we're in a very competitive environment here for staff, especially for key, uh, talented, diverse, creative staff. So, by the, the award has allowed us to to, to re retain, mm. motivate, and um, attract key key staff. Um, some of the challenges, in line with Lania said there, in terms of since winning the award, like we've grown, uh, and La Lania met, mentioned um, staff, we've grown our staff resources allocated to, to innovation. From we started in our journey in 2013 uh, with, with three staff members. Mm -hmm. We're now over 100. Um, but the idea is that, that innovation is not just solely those 100 people because we're 6,000 staff. So we want to spread that the culture of innovation across the 6,000 staff. So, so there's 100 people on your innovation team specifically? Uh, yeah, and okay. they're broken into various different sections within that, and they have different functions. But yeah, that's correct. But we want to uh, establish that culture, that team mentality of, uh, of innovation across the whole of the city council. Because in, ch in changing times, rapidly changing times, like we've had in COVID, I think it's ever more important that we have that ability to, to innovate effectively and repeatedly uh, in order to, 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 to sustain uh, our, our momentum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marcia, um, in Kashkais, where you're from, um, you also were recognized as a rising innovation city in 2021. Um, you're a smaller municipality, but I I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how you've been able to use that recognition and that higher profile um, to attract you know, a tech talent workforce, um, an innovative workforce um, to the city. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I really subscribe all these uh, different ideas that my colleagues uh, share. And in Cascais, uh, we 
um, learn very soon that we cannot do anything by ourselves. So we have to have this dynamic ecosystem uh, and this award is in that strategy of uh, attracting uh, uh, universities, uh, startups and big enterprises. And we have this um, context that is perfect for experimental uh, uh, tests uh, because we, we are not so big as a city. We, have the, the we are really a town. We have the 32 kilometers of coast, but we are a, a small town and uh, we have a lot of other small towns. So we managed to, to uh, have some pilots uh, in our, our town and sometimes they scale up, sometimes they don't, <laughs> it depends. But uh, I can give an example about the gamification with the recycling process with the citizens that for us, the citizens are really in the, in the center of everything. Uh, we, d we started in a small neighborhood and now we have in all the municipality this kind of gamification. People can have uh, points and then they change the, the, the points to go to the museums or to go to concerts in, in Cascais. So um, incentivizing people to recycle yes, using sort yes. of the gamification models. And we love technology in Cascais, we really do, but we understand that technology is just a means to, to achieve our, our accomplishments. But now we are working really hard in the Cascais cockpit that because we really felt that we need to evaluate our actions, mm -hmm. really have data to decide. Data-driven is a very important issue for us. Um, and uh, I think that th this uh, opportunity to have this award um, make Cascais be in the, in the map. <laughs> so uh, who want to come and, and work with us are welcome. Um, I will share also this, uh, we are talking about the backstage, about our new initiative to have the public transportation free for everybody. That's uh, really an effort and but shows how we um, innovate in uh, the, the old sectors. We are not a team innovating in alone in the office. We tackle the problems, we think about them and we try to look at them in an inno innovative way. So if you need to people to get the cars in home and <laughs> use another form of transportation, bikes is not really, um, really great in Cascais because we don't have, uh, um, we have a lot of ups and downs and it's not easy. And not like Amsterdam. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the, the free transportation, we really ha made a study about the financing with the taxis, with the parking, paying parking. So uh, um, I think that is a great context to experiment. So we invite you all to come and visit us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so what did you find after um, initiating free public transit for, for your residents? It's, it's really a s accomplishment. small time yet because it, it starts d uh, just after the COVID pandemic. Uh, so it's the beginning of the, uh, 2021. Um, we don't have the, maybe the results that we are expecting, but the kids and the elder and the women, they're using more the public transportation. But the men, uh, no, <laughs> they're still <laughs> using the car. So we have, we have to, to tackle now some uh, direct strategies to, to be better. Maybe our um, design of the roads maybe can, can be improved to have, to have more fast uh, dislocations. So we, ha we are studying that mm -hmm. now. And you spoke a little bit about engaging the citizenry in understanding what innovations are actually necessary, you know, not leading with the innovation first, but actually looking at the problems that your city is facing. Um, I'm wondering how you sort of balance the desire um, to fund and pursue innovative projects with the everyday crises that we're dealing with in cities every day, like war, um, like the COVID pandemic, um, like just, you know, filling the potholes. Derek, how do you justify those investments? Um, well, I think there has to be a balance, but if, if you're, you know, the, the, the story about, you know, the, the you have to pick babies out of the stream, you know, but if you're constantly doing that, you know, do you not take a moment for reflection and go upstream and see, well, who's putting the babies in the stream? So I think there's, and I think there's, there's in a really rapidly changing environment, there's a even more reason to innovate. Uh, successfully, effectively, and repeatedly. Um, and, but uh, I suppose uh, your roles as leaders, what I would say is we need to create the context for people to be able to innovate. For, uh, Lania m mentioned there the whole culture of, like, of getting the right first time. Like we're trying to adapt an agile method 
uh, whereby we say, look, we don't get things right first time. And similarly, we're, we're humble enough to say that, as, as Martha said, we don't have all the answers, but we're going to try. Um, so I think it's, you ha as leaders, you have to create that environment whereby your staff can feel comfortable innovating. I know that's not going to be a sanction as such. Yes, all right, there's going to be, have to be calls made. There's certain services that you can't do that, but there are services that, that you have that flexibility that you can innovate. And Marta, you've talked about the importance of participatory budgeting um, in your city. Obviously, um, the investment from the European um, Innovation Commission uh, was a, a new influx of, of funding, but how do you work with citizens to make those decisions about what to what innovations to fund? Yes, we, we, we have our participatory budget for a lot of time now, a lot of years. Uh, so people are waiting the, for the right time. They all have the great ideas with schools, with um, some um, uh, parks. So th th we have this community really um, organized, and they before the, the time that the time is right, they already are managing and organizing uh, from themselves. So um, I, I really think that the hearing the citizen is it's uh, uh, strategic uh, for e every city. But uh, I want to share about the innovation and investment because during the COVID, Cascais starts uh, to to have for free to citizens. Uh, video consultation with the doctors mm -hmm. because we have another disease also and people are afraid to go to the hospital because they're afraid to, to be with COVID. So uh, this, um, this was a, a quick response to a real problem. So I think citizens think, okay, municipality maybe spend some money in this, but this is for me, this is mm -hmm. responding my need right now. I have my kid is a fever. I don't want to go to the hospital. So. It's, and, and so I think it's the citizens are involved and they feel the direct effect of this uh, new politics, the innovation, they will understand the investment. So you, you have to be, be always with the foot in the ground and to respond to what is the, the needed. So right. it's not an issue maybe. Yeah, these aren't just flashy ideas that are <laughs> untested. Innovation, it's not always go to the moon. Right. Sometimes right. it's just to solve a small Connect problem. People, yes. Yeah, with, with their doctors, with their local leaders, um, and things like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I also wanted to ask you, Lamia, part of the OECD's research is on the impact of these sorts of national investments in local projects. Um, I'm wondering, what's your take on the um, European Innovation Commission's award? Um, and, you know, what other sorts of support are needed? Yes, indeed, the OECD is about national government first, and we are um, advising national government about their uh, urban policy uh, uh, framework and, uh, and actions. Now, what we can say is that traditionally, um, whether it's the in, in, in Europe or in, uh, in North America, but also in Asia, uh, national governments tend to intervene in cities by focusing on funding infrastructure, hard, the hard part. When they are um, helping for delivery of public services is through equalization mechanism, but basically innovation is not there. You know, it's not, it's not something that they are very much engaged, and they should engage, actually, uh, in the future. They should much more engage in this area. And by the way, we have been able, thanks to this, project that we did uh, collaboratively with the 150 cities and Bloomberg philanthropies, we have been able to make sure that, you know, in a recent uh, multi multi uh, multilateral guideline instrument that was adopted by all the uh, 38 countries, we have now a dedicated recommendation about the fact that national government should help cities engage in uh, public sector innovation, which Wonderful. means that the procedure should change. It, it can be, you know, they, they can completely. Dif they should differ completely from what they used to uh, to be before. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and thank you all um, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So show of hands for those who've been enjoying exploring Amsterdam either before or during the conference. 
Yes, tourism is back, and it's busy here. Incredibly, incredible thing to see. And that's what we're here to talk about, the comeback of tourism. And when the pandemic hit, all of you three city leaders, we have uh, Hirte from Amsterdam and Partners, Norbert from Vienna Tourist Board, and Enver, thank you for tuning in all the way from Cape Town, South Africa. So all of you saw your very robust visitor economies vanish, and you were able to see both the positive and negative impacts of that. Negative in that the revenue disappeared, and positive in a way because there was less environmental degradation, fewer crowds, residents were able to enjoy their own backyards without being flooded by visitors. And so now we're here and city leaders are taking the opportunity to really rethink the way they manage tourism in their destinations, particularly in major European destinations as well as Cape Town. So um, that's what we're here to talk about. I'm excited to hear your views. Here, I'm going to start with you here in Amsterdam. Mary Halsema has expressed her desire to shift the image of this city from being a destination that attracts, as she said, people who um, are wanting to take a break from their morals. <laughs> <laughs> Quote. <A> moral holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I know that this is something that you had been handling even before COVID. In 2018, you had a campaign just to discourage that kind of uh, you know, misconduct in tourism. And now here we are. I'd love to hear how has your thinking evolved in those two years in, in how to tackle these issues and how do you plan to shift this image? What are the exact top line strategies that you're using? Yeah, big question. <laughs> uh, welcome also on my behalf. I'm really happy, thanks to Bloomberg Philanthropies, that you all came to visit our beautiful city because especially business visitors as you are here today are very, very good to have because you add so much value. And that is also the baseline, I think, where the whole visitor economy should have their focus on. And value is much more than money. You bring knowledge, you bring culture, you bring inspiration. And I dare to say that I know at least 30% of the people here in the audience are thinking, hmm, maybe I should come back with my partner of, or my family one day to visit this area. <laughs> so right. I think the visitor economy can have a lot of added value to our destinations, as long as it's add value to our local hood and our city in the bigger picture. So what we saw, I think, till 2015 was that the visitor economy was only focused on more. We want to have more residents, more visitors, more businesses, more companies, because we thought it was adding value to us all. You know, we gained a lot. We have a huge cultural infrastructure. We have perfect public transport, also financed by visitors, etc. Then you saw the fast growth of the industry. So much more people were able to travel, much more costs went down, accommodation costs, travel costs, etc. And we would have never expected to have these amounts of visitors in such a short term. If you talk about the change of an image, yes. well, that's not an easy one. First and above all, you have to make sure that you have a different city. So that's why I'm really thankful to our mayor, Halsema, as we call her, um, that she has a huge product, uh, project on redesigning our old city center. Because as long as we have the offer that we have now in the city center, we will attract people that will go on moral holidays. You know, you cannot influence that with <laughs> campaigning. Luckily, and I know a lot of you experienced it as well, that is really a small part of our city. So there are a huge part of our canals, cultural infrastructure, new neighborhoods popping up that are really interesting for everybody to discover. And it's our task to see how we can manage the social algorithms so you get the right image of Amsterdam that will attract you, and then I mean you, the, res the, the visitors that really add value to our destination and the quality of life of our residents. So it's about showing other areas that are lesser known and getting visitors to know about them. Yeah, and as we saw already here in multiple examples, it's not me showing. It's the residents telling the stories. 
why they are so proud of their city and what they think is going on and is interesting for you. The biggest match is also that we're all human beings and we're 99% the same. And if we look in the data, you behave the same. So you all go to the museum in the morning and the canal boat in the afternoon. <laughs> so it helps if we have data and context. So we can suggest to you, you can do it the other way around. The other part is that you're all unique. So I cannot send out one message. The preference of Norbert is maybe different than yours, Lily. So the more we get into having ideas on who you are, there are visitors that prefer to do the basic route over and over again because they're risk averse. They don't want to be guided off the beaten track. They don't want to discover new neighborhoods. So we know who the, these people are. There you have to guide them in time and rhythm. If we know that people love to have a new experience and love to discover new things, we have a huge different communication. Great. Um, Enver, I know that you and I spoke earlier this year just as your restrictions were you know, easing up, but you had gone through a series of bans on South Africa, and you were losing hundreds of millions every month in forward bookings. Now it's a completely different picture. You're bouncing back. And um, I know that you're also very focused on, s on bringing back tourism in a way that is more sustainable, inclusive. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us, what, what does that look like? Sustainability has a different definition depending on the destination we're talking about. What does it look like for your city? So, uh, Lily, firstly, good afternoon and greetings from Cape Town. Hello, Gerta. I know it. <laughs> um, so, so I think to your point is the challenge for us as a destination is different from, let's say, Europe, where for us growth and volume is the critical part of making sure that uh, our economy and our jobs can grow. Because I think tourism is still in its infancy here in South Africa. And for us, um, the importance is, and I think Kirta spoke about it, was the more but which, what we look at is actually saying is that tourism has been unbalanced for a long time. And what's critically important for us is to focus on how do we rebalance tourism when we talk about the restart. And that means, to a large extent, being inclusive with communities in redesigning a destination and visitor experiences, uh, surveying communities about their happiness or unhappiness with tourism, similar to when we survey visitors about their experience, so for us, it's actually kind of finding a balanced approach to how we sustain tourism, how we develop tourism, and of course, how do we grow tourism for our city. So for us, it's a learning curve, uh, something that we continue to uh, work at, but also fail at quite often. Um, but for us, we understand the importance of uh, the value of tourism, of both being an enabler of communities, but also an economic driver, if done in the right way. Okay, I want to bring up the poll that we ran with our audience on, um, on tourism, um, see if it comes up on one of the screens here. Um, in the meantime, I mean, isn't there a conflict between, oh, there it is. Um, so does tourism help improve the quality of life in your city? And an overwhelming 70%, that's great, some very smart people in this room. <laughs> um, Thank you. So isn't there a conflict though between saying, well, we want to grow tourism, but we want to balance Yes, so we don't want to grow tourism anymore. Okay. We totally shifted from quantity to quality. And as soon as we know how to manage the public space, so we do not experience the crowdedness in a few streets in the old okay. city center and abroad, then we can maybe host more people. But growth in itself is not a goal okay. from our city. Norbert, Vienna's done, been doing very well bouncing back. I know that in July, for the first time, you passed a million mark visitor per month. Um, and you were actually ahead of the curve because just before the pandemic, you launched a visitor economy strategy that also speaks of this balance, the need for balance. So can you tell us how, what that, what that really involved and how that has shifted or changed your plan? How has the pandemic impacted your plan? Yes, first of all, it's great to be here. Great to be in Amsterdam. <laughs> I've been definitely coming back, <laughs> <laughs> often so, Herte knows that. Uh, uh, one, I think, important remark as well, we had an incredible summer in tourism in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, and that shows that traveling is an accomplishment of civilization, and the people will not let it take, uh, take it away from him. 
from them, and that's, I think, is very important, because probably the 20th century would have looked differently if the people had traveled to that amount in 1910 than they did in 2019. So uh, even the title of the visitor economy strategy shows where, uh, where we, were, we were heading. It wasn't a tourism strategy anymore. It was a visitor economy strategy. So because every tourist is a visitor, but not every visitor is a tourist. Because we have 200,000 students in Vienna. We have experts, we have international organizations. They are visitors for some time, but they are not tourists. So first of all, we take care of them as well. Then we saw another shift from a tourism marketing organization to a tourism marketing and management organization. So we would not get rid of our responsibility towards our local people toward, towards the government. Then another pillar was the idea that mass tourism does not need support or promotion. Mm. It, it, it needs regulation and rules in the city because otherwise the local people will at a certain point say, not so much in Vienna, we know that nine of 10 Viennese say, okay, we are very fine with tourism. Uh, but at a certain point, they would say it's too much. Mm -hmm. And, and th these were the yeah. pillars where we were moving in. And uh, we started conversation before we published the strategy with a lot of different communities, like the academia, like gastronomy, yeah. like the uh, hotels, of course, but also with local uh, politicians. We have 23 uh, boroughs in, in Vienna. And so, we, and during the pandemic, we could even build up on this and, and working on this infrastructure we created by doing this strategy and so because actually only by switching on the camera we could talk to different communities in the city during the lockdowns during the pandemic and that really helped us and i think this is a very important thing because we are right now in in the shift uh, in the old days the tourism tourism managers would have said uh, it's all us the boom it's us we are so effective we are so <laughs> wonderful <laughs> no we weren't yeah we okay. were lucky because the, the globalization helped city tourism the accessibility helped us the low-cost airlines helped us in the beginning so we have still to consider this yes and there there are many things uh which are shifting towards uh, another direction we have to consider this as well okay now in the i want to switch over to short-term rentals which have had an enormous impact, both mostly harmful <laughs> in many places, many cities and neighborhoods have shifted because of short-term rentals. Um, I want to read to you a quote from Brian Chesky, who's the CEO of Airbnb, who was at Skiff Global Forum in September and said, cities will never be as important as they were before the pandemic. It used to be the place to be was the city, and now the place to be is the internet. Any thoughts on who, that? Who starts <laughs> screaming? <laughs> uh, we, were, we were just discussing Anyone this. <laughs> well, I think if the world would have been on the internet, we would have been in an online conference with Bloomberg Philanthropies. And I think we all experienced during the pandemic that it was so helpful that we at least could meet online. But we also experienced what a lack it was if it comes to coincidentally meeting somebody that you would never ever meet before, getting three-dimensional energy from somebody instead of being focused on a topic in a meeting with a list and a time frame. So I totally disagree and I totally yeah. believe on any topic we already discussed these two days on NFTs and blockchain and the possibilities of your digital yeah. twin. This is the future, but still, I think, as long as we are the human beings as we're now, we long and we grave for personal contact and for being real and physical in the real world. And that is also why private holiday rental was harmful in cities like Amsterdam. Mm. I'm not ha talking about rural areas where it was maybe profitable because it was not cost efficient to build a hotel, but now people can host visitors as well, if it benefits the local. In our city, it didn't. It took away a lot of houses from the market, and we as Amsterdam people have to fight hard to find a house anyway. 
Yeah. So that is why we think from city perspective, it takes out the co social cohesion, it takes out the responsibility for the city. So it didn't add any value yeah. for us. So how do you think of, you know, I mean, now there's even more untethered folks who are, you know, remote working, digital nomads, heading for longer periods of time. And for how are you thinking of this segment and managing that in your vision for tourism? So I think to, to hit this point is, is that I think to a large extent, whether it's Airbnb, Ubers, they were disruptors and government policy, et cetera, they acted too slowly to deal with it. And I think that's why what ended up happening is the friction between locals uh, being disenfranchised and, and an economy which was also an opportunity for people to generate more revenue for themselves. So I think, again, it comes down to balance. And how, how we've looked at it from a Cape Town perspective was saying, well, if there is going to be this uh, short-term rentals, then the rules need to also be similar to when you're looking at the formal accommodation se sector, because again, the rules wasn't the same. So therefore, undercutting of price, et cetera, et cetera. But how we see this going forward is, is that we're focusing on, and we've actually partnered with Airbnb um, about a week ago in looking at the digital nomad space. Because for us, again, to what Hirta said, is we're looking at the quality of the visitor and probably a higher yield visitor than a volumes game. Because we want to find that balance between the locals and that of the value of tourism in its creation. And for us, the digital nomads became almost an easy uh, way to look at things because, again, of innovation and the acceptance of a lot of people around technology. I think before COVID, people were very scared of technology. They didn't understand it. But COVID has forced us to almost embrace technology, understand its value, and how we can extract and innovate from there. So for a destination like Cape Town, how we see the partnership with, for example, uh, Airbnb is focused purely on digital nomads because we know that they are going to stay longer and spend more uh, in a destination and with the right infrastructure and the right communication and the right technology and accessibility, we are able then to leverage that longer stay um, in the destination, but also then making sure that they also become part of the local economy. And I think that also becomes part of what I think Norbert spoke about is destination management. How do we make sure that when we are going to do these partnerships, that the communities um, are involved in the conversation. And I think that's been at the core of what we've been focusing on as Cape Town Tourism for at least the last eight years is um, community-based tourism decision-making. Um, otherwise, why are we doing this? We keep saying we want to create jobs for locals, economic impact for locals. But if the locals are not part of that conversation and also the decision-making, then that becomes a, a recipe for disaster. So for us, again, um, you know, different strokes with different folks, but for us, we understand the importance of growing our economy, but we also want to find it again in a balanced approach where we're focusing on high yield visitors for longer stays rather than a quick in and out, which again has a significant impact on volumes. And then of course, the having to clean up after them um, has again, the other unintended and indirect consequences for a destination in both cost and sustainability. Thank you so much, all three of you, for your insights. And I'm sure that um, there are many more cities represented here who'd love your advice on growing tourism, but in a more balanced mm, way. Just one comment sure. on the quote you said. I have to say, it. so just never forget, all great things started in cities and all great things still start in city. I think this is very important for all of us. Yes, I agree with that. Thank you. Hello, I am Mariana Matsukato. I am the director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And a big thank you to Michael Bloomberg and to Jim Anderson and the whole of City Lab for inviting me to speak to you. I am thrilled that the institute that I founded to rethink the state, to rethink public purpose and the dynamic capabilities required for public purpose is collaborating with Bloomberg Philanthropies. I think that we become way too stuck in how we think about government. At best, we think about government in terms of fixing market failures. Uh, you know, at worst, get out of the way. That's not what we need, neither one of those, in order to solve the very complex challenges that we face globally at every level, at the local, at the regional, and national level, to truly tackle climate change, to zero the digital divide, to strengthen our global health systems, we need to be talking and thinking about shaping and co-creating markets, not fixing them. 
And that idea of co-creation and co-shaping is precisely what requires dynamic capabilities. So the question is, what are these dynamic capabilities that perhaps are missing on the ground in order to foster innovation and investment across as many different actors as possible to battle those targets, to treat them as true moonshots, as I talk about in my book called Mission Economy, a moonshot guide to changing capitalism. So we know capabilities are key, but what are they? And you know, the answer is we especially know when they're not there. If you look at how the world reacted to COVID-19 when it first came about, we realized that those capabilities weren't there. In fact, they were interestingly there in some countries that perhaps we wouldn't have expected. Uh, if we think of what happened in Vietnam, if we look at what happened in Kerala and in India, but also Togo and Rwanda, these are countries that are still developing and yet for different reasons had actually invested in different aspects of their public administrations and actually did much better than many countries even in the West. Uh, that doesn't mean everything was perfect, of course, but this point that actually capabilities are outcomes of investment, they are outcomes of a decision that we must make to invest within public administrations instead of just outsource that capacity to consultants or whoever is one of the first really important steps. And I think that there's been a narrative problem that if at best a, a local or regional or national government is there to fix a market failure, to enable the private sector to de-risk the risk takers, then we haven't actually asked those fundamental questions of what does it mean to have capabilities not to de-risk, but to welcome uncertainty, not simply to level the playing field, but to tilt it through really you know, bold and inspirational targets around clean growth and to do everything we can to reward those actors moving in that direction. To not simply, uh, again, fix, but to actually focus on the goal. So what does it mean to have an outcomes orientation for example, to the budgeting process and outcomes orientation to procurement, which of course, both of those are things we do for the military industrial complex. Why don't we do it in normal times, also at the very local level? Uh, what does that look like on the ground? And one of the great things we'll be doing with Bloomberg is really also sharing that knowledge of you know, cities that have in fact developed those capabilities, sharing that knowledge between mayors, but especially creating a dynamic where we learn from the ground up and kind of allow these lessons to go beyond just being pet projects or peripheral um, experiences to really going to the center of how we rethink the economy. Um, you know, we need agile cities. We need ambitious, open, resilient, flexible cities. What does, again, that mean for the tools? What does it mean for the new economic thinking? What does it also mean for the evaluation of different types of policies? Um, so thank you so much again for allowing me to make these remarks. And again, I really look forward to my institute working very closely with Bloomberg philanthropies around moonshot thinking on the dynamic capabilities of the state. Thank you so much. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the final session of our final day of City Lab. It's so nice to see everyone. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies is thrilled to be collaborating with Mariana Mazzucato and her team uh, because we have been stuck in how we think about government and local government in particular. And in order to tackle the challenges, the complex challenges ahead, we need to be investing in the public sector and in the capacities that she's referenced and that Bloomberg Philanthropies has been investing in over the past decade. These are the capacity to use data, the capacity to engage residents, the capacity to form mutualistic partnerships with the private sector and civil society, the capacity to think outside the box. These investments enable local government to play their central and essential role in steering transitions at urban scale in our energy systems, our mobility systems, our food systems, as part of our efforts to create societies where every single member can thrive. The good news here is that we are not starting from a standstill. The public sector innovation movement is alive and thriving as evidenced in this room and here in Amsterdam over the past two days. The labs that popped up in the early 2000s, we heard from Christian Bassan, one of the early pioneers, uh, the Poverty Action Lab that Linda Gibbs started in New York in 2006, 
These have been followed by hundreds of innovation offices and officers, data units, and labs, all focused on creating a more modern local government and a capacity to innovate and adapt. We just heard in the data session the incredibly central role this capacity played during the pandemic. It's worth emphasizing, in Long Beach, the innovation teams helped that city develop one of the most ambitious and, and, and rapid approaches to testing and vaccination in some of the most hesitant communities in their community. In Bogota, Santi knows, innovation units helped cut through bureaucracy to get 100,000 tablets into the households of poor children at the outset of the pandemic, not at the end of it. As we've also heard from Eastern European mayors, the data units played a central role in helping them understand needs as thousands of people were coming into their communities and pinpoint services in rapid order. Research published last year by the OECD also shows us that cities with higher public sector innovation capacity also have higher levels of city and life satisfaction. That's critical. As we all know, you go into the game with the team you got, not the team you want. And we need a local government that leads with agility and responsiveness in the face of our big challenges. That's what we're all here building together. Now, we are beginning to see the next generation of these efforts. It's a shift towards greater complexity, more sustainability, and impact at scale. And that brings me to my recent trip to Mexico City. I spent time meeting Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum at City Hall. She is the first woman uh, to lead the city and probably one of the first mayors, if not the only mayor in the world, to earn a PhD in both energy engineering and physics. She and her team showed me this historic building that has been the seat of government in the city of palaces for more than 500 years. I visited Pepe Marino, who's been with us for the last two days, and his team at the city's digital agency, of public, digital agency for public innovation, and began to understand the thoughtful integration of policy leadership, engineering, and design capabilities that are at the heart of what they've built and at the heart of what they're doing in this city. But it was at the civil registry office that, that really everything clicked for me. This place is the central repository for vital records, home to the birth certificates, the marriage licenses, the divorce decrees for nearly 10 million people. These are the documents that are essential to the transactions of social, political, and business life. But for so many of the poorest residents of this city, accessing these documents meant skipping a day of work, spending long hours in lines, or paying bribes. Requirements that are untenable and unreasonable in any city that values democracy and access. Now in Mayor Scheinbaum's CDMX, this office will become, is becoming, open and accessible, enabled by digital and connected to the poorest residents across the community through their phones. It's a radical, inclusive, ambitious approach for making public services real in the lives of every single resident in a city that really that needs it. And this is why I'm so pleased to be joined today by Mayor Scheinbaum to talk about her vision and her approach. I'm going to go over to the chair so I can snuggle up to her on the screen. Um, <laughs> buenos dias, Mayor Scheinbaum. Uh, I know buenos it's dia. early. <laughs> it's early there. Welcome to City Lab. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, welcome to Mexico City. Bye. <laughs> 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 it's great to see you again. Um, you know, oftentimes at, at conferences like these or when you talk with city leaders, you, you hear them talk about a smart cities agenda, a technology agenda. They talk a lot about the solution. I really noticed when you and I met that that is not at all where you start these conversations. Tell us why this agenda has been important to you and, and, and what it's grounded in. Yes, thank you very much. Well, since we entered to the government, we say that the city's motto for our government is that we are a city of rights and innovation. Rights mean for us the right for education for everybody, to public health, better environment, access to internet, 
and a better relation between citizens and government. So we believe that through digital innovation, we can make sure that everyone in Mexico City has access to the rights that they deserve. So digital services must be put to the service, especially to the poorest of the city. It's not just an interest to have a better digitalization of every um, services that the government provide. In many places, digital innovation has been centered around making the most advantaged people for comfortable. In Mexico City, change, we changed this model, or at least uh, that's what we want to change. This means using digital to give people access to the rights they have been denied historically. Digital innovation in Mexico City is a way to reduce brutal inequalities of the past. So our objective is to ensure that through connectivity and digital services, everyone in Mexico City have access to the rights they deserve, to connect to the people they love, or to get access to knowledge, or to have access to governmental services. So it's more than putting the government in the service to the people, uh, rather than a, uh, a, a thing that, um, government need to digitalize every permit that they have. Incredibly powerful and um, an ambitious and, um, and beautiful vision. Um, so we'll talk in a moment about the breadth and the impact that you're having. Um, but first, you're an engineer. I know you can get into the weeds. How did you lift this ambitious effort off the ground? What were the first steps you took to facilitate this bold agenda? Well, the first thing that we did is to create the Digital Agency for Public Innovation. Uh, you know, many people think that uh, innovation is only uh, a way for private enterprises and that government is not, it's, it's not possible for government to uh, produce innovation. So we could agency. Uh, we have many young people working on this agency. And we have proved that innovation is part also of uh, governmental, of a state process. Mm -hmm. So we are convinced that digitalization is a way to empower citizens. And uh, that's why we create this agency. One of the things, just to point out to everyone in the room, as this, this law took effect at the time the mayor went into office, so she worked to get the law passed before she got there, but it consolidates, Mayor, I think n a number of agencies that you wanted all to be under one umbrella reporting directly into the mayor. Why was that consolidation and that proximity to the mayor important to you? The first thing is that many regulations uh, happen in any minister of the city. Um, uh, so the first thing that we did is that there was not possible to make a new regulation if you didn't pass through the agency. So that's very important because you have in one place uh, re uh, regulation or, or deregulation, uh, depending on what you want to see. And at the same time, you have digitalization and access to every services that the government gives uh, to the poorest people of the city. So that's the philosophy that uh, where we create the, the agency. Well, we have developed a, uh, actually a factory of software um, with these young people. There are around 40 young people that, is work, that are working in this uh, agency. Um, we have stopped... Um, um, uh, um, paying for, for services, for digital services, and we are actually, you know, bringing everything almost for free. Uh, we have created a lot of software for inside the government and outside the government, and uh, decreasing many, many um, uh, tramits that we have to do by, by the services that the government provides. So this is not possible if the chief of government is not directly involved in what we're creating and also directly involved with the citizens if, uh, to see what you're doing is uh, really happening. 
it, again, it's just worth noting because it is incredibly unusual. Mexico City has a technology factory. They are, they are building their own technology in-house. They are resisting the outsourcing. They are resisting buying products off of the shelf. M Mayor, why is, that, why is that important to you? It's, it's incredibly unorthodox. Um, why, why is that a central part of the, of the reform that you're driving? Okay, I, I would say uh, uh, the driving is one, it's uh, that we know that we have local talent of young people to create it. The second thing is that we use um, open software um, and that's very, very important because um, you not involve the city in a long-term contract to private um, um, enterprises for um, services. Uh, so we develop it. And the other thing is that we save a lot of money, <laughs> almost about probably 150,000 um, million, million, 150 million dollars uh, doing this. Great. So let's, uh, let's now talk a little bit about some of the impact that you're having. Um, uh, I understand. Let me give you a few of your statistics, and you can tell me if I'm, if I'm off here. They, she started with 90 free Wi-Fi spots in 2019. By the end of this year, there will be 34,000 free Wi-Fi spots, the largest free Wi-Fi network in any city in the world. Your Yave, the single sign-on digital key, has over 65% of Mexico City adults now participating, incredible penetration. You've replaced 40 different apps with a single app uh, to make digital complaints to get COVID results. Mayor, with results like these, where do you go next? Okay, first we have to consolidate everything that we have developed. Um, we are now, as you said, the more the most connected city in the world. We have, we are going to end this year with 33,000 Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi points. We are connecting every public school. We are connecting 300, uh, 3,500 um, uh, un units, housing developed. Housing developed. Um, we have around 15,000 points around the city. And we are now to the poorest part of the city to also give connectivity as a right. Um, and um, through that, we, um, we think that access to internet, it's also a right for the citizens. It is not, um, if you have citizens uh, that only the one that, ha that can pay have access to internet, then what you're going to do is increase um, um, separation, increase um, inequalities in the city. So for us, it's very, very important that people can access uh, to free internet. Um, and also it's free. I mean, they want to do what they want. Uh, we think that people are uh, all, um, responsible for their lives. We, you know, the state has not uh, the, uh, the right to go through the citizens. We are uh, we just want to give them the right to do that. Um, the second thing is that we're working on YAVE, as you said, it's the key to the governmental services. So we are going to consolidate YAVE. So if you have uh, 18 years old and you are going to have your, your first, um, you know, connect to the government, uh, what we want is along your life, if you live in Mexico City, you don't have to give any other um, uh, paper that the government already have. Um, uh, maybe if you change your address or something like that, but you have your small uh, key uh, or your small um, um, say, file, your small file, uh, save file uh, for every citizens in Mexico City. That's going to be, uh, you know, a huge advantage for the citizens and for the government. So you're going to have a digital connection and probably you're going to end the, 
the lines. The other thing that we have driver, digital driver licenses, digital you know, permit for your car, and many other digital services that uh, put the Mexico City in, in another part um, um, comparing to other cities, not only in Mexico, but in the world. Who agrees with me that a study trip to Mexico City might be in order? Um, thank you, Mayor. It's really brilliant. I'm going to leave you with one final question. We have a room full of people all committed to making their cities more innovative places and putting values at the center of that work. If you have a single piece of advice for cities that may not be as far along as you, what would that be? Okay, the first thing is that believe in your people, always. You know, they, they have a, a key for the future. <laughs> Uh, there's always this uh, um, thing that you have to contract, you know, private enterprises for many, many things. And that's good for some, some services. But believing your young people, that's, you know, the first thing that I could say. The second thing is that don't be afraid to do this. It's, uh, uh, once you go and uh, believe in, in the people that it's... Uh, doing all these things, um, you're going to find a way to connect to your citizens. And um, this is, you know, the best way that you can do. And the other thing is be connected to your citizens because <laughs> um, sometimes you think that you solve many, many problems, uh, but you have to be in contact if you really solve them or you're thinking only from your office. <laughs> Wonderful. Gracias, Mayor Scheinbaum. Thank you for joining us. Please give the mayor a warm uh, thank you. Thank you. Great. So what a terrific last uh, thought for us all to leave City Lab with. Believe in your people. Um, I love that. That's it for City Lab 2022. What an incredible few days it's been. On behalf of Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, another thanks to the city of Amsterdam and to our incredible partners, Kitty, Dan, and the awesome partners at the Aspen Institute. We're so grateful for the partnership. Thank you. I want to give a shout out and a big thanks to Courtney Greenwald on the Bloomberg Philanthropies Government Innovation Team for her extraordinary work. And thanks to you all. Your participation has been off the charts. We've never had a full house at the end uh, before, which is quite exciting. We're going to be coming to you very soon with news on our next de destination for City Lab 2023. We will certainly be uh, taking you to another one of the world's most innovative cities and look forward to reconnecting then. Thank you very much.